So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERPI is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERPI has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <clears throat> Pag nahuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon.
Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliktik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at pulisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner, Seminars, and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies, Service Through Policy Research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <clears throat> Pag nahuli tayo, wala tayo may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. 
Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at pulisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ng isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isa ilalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga pulisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat ring ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS, ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at pulisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the PIDS, PIDS webinar series where we discuss development issues based on data and evidence. So our participants from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, magandang uh, hapon po sa inyong lahat. I'm Sheila CR, and I will be your moderator. We are tackling another very uh, interesting topic today. The focus of our discussion is a labor market analysis conducted by PIDS, which looked into the future science and technology human resource needs of the country. To officially open our event, may I call on the president of PIDES, Dr. Celia Reyes, Mamsel. Thank Mamsel. you, Sheila. Yes, uh, before we, we begin, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following. Um, 
Neda Undersecretary for Policy and Planning, Rosemary Abilion. Neda Assistant Secretary for Policy and Planning, Carlos Bernardo Abad Santos. Neda Regional Director, Nestor Rillon. Department of Labor and Employment Bureau of Local Employment Assistant Secretary, Dominic Kutai. Commission on Higher Education Technical Panel for Information Technology Chairman, Paulina Tan. Senate Economic Planning Office Director for Economic Planning Policy Studies, Sarah Sesni Tapan. Department of Science and Technology Regional Director, Nancy Bantog. Department of Science and Technology, Philippine Council for Industry, Energy, and Emerging Technology Research and Development, Executive Director, Enrico Paringit. Department of Science and Technology, Science Education Institute, Deputy Director, Albert Marino. Food and Nutrition Research Institute Director and Scientist Imelda Angeles Agdepa, Food and Nutrition Research Institute Deputy Director Anthony Calibo, Philippine Textile Research Institute Director Celia Elumba, Philippine Association of Social Workers Founder and Chief Executive Officer Maria Lourdes Magdaso, and our very own PIDS Board Member and Former President Dr. Gilberto Llanto. And from the private sector, we have in one go technologies, President Ramon Garcia, SGV and, Com and um, Corporations Senior Director Christian Chua, HOM Consulting CEO Paul Mavilla. And from the academe, we're joined this afternoon by University of the Philippines School of Economics Professor Emerit Emeritus Edita Tan, University of the Philippines Diliman Engineering Research and Development for Technology Associate Dean Gerald Joe Denoga. Cagayan State University President Urduha Alvarado, Mountain Province State Polytechnic University, Polytechnic College President Rexton Chacas, Philippine Science High School Director Jonald Penesios, Mindanao State University Iligan Institute of Technology, College of Science and Mathematics Dean Metilio, and from Southern Luzon State University, um, we have Deans Renato Maaliu. Dean Denalin Pino de Hello, Dean Ricaril, Catherine Cruz, and uh, Dean Marietta Villaverde. And from Mater Day Academy, Dean Ross Alonso, and from De La Salle University School of Economics, Dean Marites Chionco, and from Pamantasan ng Sud ng Maynila, Dean Luz Vininda Gabor. And we also have friends from um, the United Nations Development Program, Philippines, Deputy Resident Representative Enrico Gaveglia. As ASEAN Secretariat Director Rodora Babaran, Permanent Delegate to UNESCO in Paris, Eileen Mendiola Rao, Internet Society Vice President of Technology, Aris Ignacio, and Board Member of Froilan Mobo, and Masaganong Pakahan Director, Daniel Agustin, and UP Engineering R&D Foundation Executive Director, Alfonso Aliga. Let me also greet our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Good afternoon and welcome to our public webinar. This afternoon's virtual event will feature the PIDS study titled Future SMT Human Resource Requirements in the Philippines, a labor market analysis conducted by PIDS Senior Research Fellow Jose Ramon Albert, Pulse Asia Research Director Ana Maria Tabunda, UP Professor Carlos Primo David, PIDS Research Fellow Chris Francisco, former PIDS Research Fellow Janet Cuenca, and PIDS Research Specialist Jana Florbis Dismanos. This study was commissioned by the OSD Science Education Institute, uh, or SEI. We're grateful to the OST SEI for the partnership, and we look forward to more collaborations with the OST in the SMT research and knowledge exchange. SMT is an important driver of social and economic progress in the country, especially in light of the ongoing pandemic. Our current situation has compelled many companies to automate and adopt technologies for business continuity. It has created the demand for new jobs and skill sets that are related to SMT. Unfortunately, the Philippines falls short in these areas, both in terms of supply and competencies. We need to address this to cope with the demands of future work. The pandemic has triggered various industries to rethink, revisit, and update their business models. 
According to the World Economic Forum's Future of Jobs Report 2020, 43% of businesses surveyed indicated that they are set to reduce their workforce due to technology integration, while 41% plan to expand their use of contractors for task specialized work, and 34% plan to expand their workforce due to technology integration. Based on the PIDS study, only 5% of the country's employed population are SMT professionals or practitioners. It also noted that by 2025, there will be an undersupply of SMT workers in life sciences, physical sciences, mathematics and statistics, and engineering, and an oversupply of workers in information technology. Given the scenarios, it is necessary for the Philippine government to invest more in educating and reskilling Filipinos in SMT. Various government agencies like the Department of Science and Technology and the Commission on Higher Education offer scholarships to students who are willing to pursue careers in the fields of science and technology. For instance, the DOST and the Republic Act 7687 offers undergraduate scholarships to poor but deserving students. It also provides scholarships to those who would like to pursue graduate studies, such as the Accelerated Science and Technology Human Resource Development Program, National Science Consortium, Capacity Building Program in Science and Mathematics, Engineering Research and Development for Technology, and other scholarships. CHED also offers scholarships and financial assistance to students through the Student Financial Assistance Programs. We will know more of about these programs and other related topics from our speakers this afternoon. At this point, let me thank Secretary Fortunato de la Peña, who will provide the message and also join us in this afternoon's uh, webinar. Uh, let me also thank former NASD President Dr. William Padolina, Chair Technical Committee for Marine Biology Chairman Dr. Laura David, Unilab Foundation's Program Lead for STEM Leadership Alliance and Workforce Development. Mr. Benedict Buhain, and Department of Labor and Employment Institute for Labor Studies Executive Director, Ama Karisma Satumba, for accepting our invitation to serve as discussants in this afternoon's webinar. We are honored to have all of you in our virtual event. Let me also thank the OST, particularly SEI, for partnering with PIDS, not only in the conduct of the study, but also in this knowledge dissemination forum. To our viewers, I hope you will all stay until the end of the webinar and actively participate during the open forum. I now give back the floor to Sheila. Thank you. And thank you too, Mamsel. Our next speaker is uh, the Secretary of the Department of Science and Technology. Um, he is a man of science. He's an engineer and a professor for more than 14 years at the University of the Philippines. And prior to, a, to his current post, he served as head of planning of the OST, then director of the Technology Application and Promotion Institute, and later as undersecretary for scientific and technical services. Friends, I invite, I invite you to listen to the message of Secretary Fortunato de la Peña. Warmest greetings to everyone. First of all, I would like to acknowledge and thank the organizers of this uh, webinar, our participants, and of course, the notable uh, speakers from various sectors and uh, institutions uh, for this public uh, webinar. I would like to uh, uh, give special greetings to Dr. Jose Ramon Albert of the PD PIDS, to Dr. Uh, William Padolina of the National Academy of Science and Technology, to Ms. Ama Karisma Satumba of the Institute of Labor Studies of DOLE, uh, to uh, Benedict Buhain, the program lead for uh, uh, STEM Leadership Alliance and Workforce Development under the Unilab uh, Foundation, uh, to uh, Dr. Cherry Melanie Ancheta Jego, uh, the Director for at uh, uh, Office of Programs and Standards Development at the Commission on Higher Education. 
and of course to our uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Bio, Director of the Science uh, Education uh, Institute. And uh, to all our participants joining uh, virtually, welcome to this public uh, webinar. This is a very timely activity. And uh, while we would have uh, wanted to uh, uh, interact face to face to get the most uh, out of the insights and discussions, we are still uh, grateful to have this avenue for us to uh, gather. And uh, so we welcome everyone to this webinar, which aims to uh, showcase a joint study uh, by the PIDS, uh, a state uh, think tank, and our Science Education Institute of the Department of Science and Technology. Uh, we thank them both for their uh, continuing uh, efforts in uh, leading initiatives that uh, widen our perspective in the state of our science and technology, human resources in our country, and uh, uh, for the PIDS uh, for lending their wisdom and uh, expertise in coming up with this uh, significant uh, study. This study in uh, focus looked into the prevailing supply and demand conditions and patterns and uh, recent uh, trends on science and technology or SNT human capital in the Philippines. The results uh, will provide us a foresight and uh, valuable inputs as policy implementers in the science and technology landscape. Way before this uh, pandemic uh, uh, hit us, uh, the science community had long been strategizing and uh, pushing for programs that effectively and constantly infuse innovation across our economic uh, sectors. It is uh, it has been a part of our socio-economic agenda for years, and this is largely because if we fail to keep up with technological disruptions happening at such a fast rate, our industries can be trapped into the path of uh, obsolescence. Emerging technologies and changing business models are serious challenges for developing nations like ours. This means innovation, in terms of policies, ways of doing business, education, and the public services uh, becomes a must. And uh, with this pandemic uh, making us rethink a lot of things again, the Filipino science community uh, has its hands full in uh, the coming days, weeks, and uh, even uh, years. I would like to uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, highlight uh, the uh, uh, some of the items in the in the uh, ten point economic agenda of uh, uh, this administration, uh, which were announced as uh, early as uh, uh, the start of the administration in 2016. Out of the ten, there are actually four that uh, relate to science and technology, and perhaps it is uh, good to uh, mention them again because I think uh, there is. Uh, uh, great relevance to this uh, study. One of them is uh, uh, being globally competitive. Uh, and uh, by that, uh, we mean in uh, various aspects, whether we are talking of business, whether we are talking of uh, human resources uh, and others. The other one is uh, uh, having uh, uh, world-class uh, human resources. And uh, uh, that is uh, very, very uh, directly linked to this uh, study of uh, ours. We also have the improvement in our value chain, particularly uh, those that affect our uh, rural uh, industries. And uh, the fourth one uh, is uh, a little uh, unique in the sense that it tries to marry science, technology, and the arts. And uh, that particular agenda is the promotion of science, technology, and the creative arts Okay, uh, to enhance uh, inclusive development. And uh, so uh, we uh, would like to uh, really uh, uh, see what uh, we will have in the future or, to, or what we will need in the future so that uh, we can continue to uh, uh, have strategies that are really going to support those uh, goals that uh, I have mentioned. Uh, of course, uh, uh, that that would be a continuing uh, uh, target, okay? Uh, uh, 
we, we may not be able to finish everything okay in a certain given period but that will be a continuing target so while we analyze potential scenarios it is uh, crucial for policymakers uh, government institutions the education sector and even the present students themselves to anticipate changes in the labor landscape in the near term future given the rapid changes in the world economy this webinar will help us gather ideas and discuss with experts who have been scoping the horizon to paint a picture of the future of labor markets what will it look like what kind of skills should our learners develop to be prepared for what's to come what kind of policy should be put in place and can philippine industries truly adapt to global change central to this gathering is the presentation of the collaborative study of the dost uh, sei and pids uh, this study will uh, present us not just current trends in the state of our science and technology human resources but also valuable recommendations on what we can do uh, to uh, better respond to these uh, trends. We are excited to learn more from the results of this study and from the insights of our experts. Let us make this session a very fruitful one and may I remind everyone to listen and ask questions with the bigger picture, our future in mind. Allow me to uh, mention that uh, perhaps we at the DOST uh, should also look at the other statements of uh, mission and uh, direction. For example, those that we find in uh, the uh, uh, plans and uh, strategies of the different uh, line agencies, the other uh, departments, those that we find in our uh, uh, Philippine uh, Development Plan, uh, the different chapters of the Philippine Development Plan can be a good source of uh, uh, a vision and uh, direction for the future. And uh, if I may also mention our own uh, uh, collegial body, the National Academy of Science and Technology, is in the process of uh, developing what they call an uh, STI foresight, a uh, science and technology and innovation foresight that uh, uh, travels or that brings us up to the year 2015. And uh, Dr. Tadulina is quite familiar with that. Uh, since he is very much involved in that uh, NAST uh, uh, strategic uh, 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 STI foresight uh, study. So I uh, again would like to thank uh, the organizers uh, uh, and those who did this study and uh, I uh, would really uh, be happy to hear uh, the different insights that will be shared by our uh, very renowned uh, speakers. Thank you very much. Marami kong salamat. At maraming salamat din po, Secretary De La Pena, for taking the time to uh, uh, send your message. Uh, we were, um, your staff told us that you are currently attending a meeting, but you will drop by later to personally greet our participants. Okay, friends, let us now proceed to the presentation of the study. And you can see on the screen the study, uh, the authors of the study led by uh, Dr. Jose Ramon Albert. Uh, other, uh, uh, his co-authors include Dr. Ana Maria Tabunda, Dr. Carlos Primo David, Dr. Chris Francisco Abrigo, Dr. Charlie Labina, Dr. Janet Cuenca, and Ms. Chana Flor Vesmanos. The study will be presented by uh, Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, who is a senior research fellow at PIDS with expertise on education, Social Protection, Poverty, Big Data, Data Mining, and ICT. Dr. Albert has a long list of achievements. Among these include uh, serving as the Secretary General of the National Statistical Coordination Board, which was consolidated with other statistics offices into the Philippine Statistics Authority. So over to you now, Dr. Albert, for your presentation. Thank you, Sheila. Good afternoon to all, uh, SecBoy, uh, Dr. Uh, Celereas. On behalf of the entire study team, uh, uh, 
I will be presenting the highlights of our study. Uh, and this study actually is the result, as I was already mentioned, of a partnership with the DOST Science Education Institute, which two decades ago commissioned UPPI, the Population Institute, the UPSS, UP School of Statistics, and the University of Asia and the Pacific to project demands in the SNT human resources uh, of the country for the period 2000 to 2010 in the government, academe, and industry sectors, respectively. After an introduction and a brief background regarding our current research, I will be proceeding to an overview of the SNT workforce as seen from data source from the Labor Force Survey. Then I discuss outlooks of the industry, academe, and government sectors based on various empirical analysis of data from the population censuses, population projections, as well as several administrative data sources. Then I uh, move on to ways forward to wrap up the presentation before proceeding with the Q&A. To start with, we are well aware that while science and technology is the backbone of the innovation ecosystem and economic growth, and of course, we heard from Secboy earlier, com competition globally, we want to make ourselves globally competitive. Unfortunately, the country has sadly invested very little in SNT. Our pool of human resources in SNT has been very limited, especially when compared with developing countries in East Asia, such as China, Singapore, Malaysia, that are at the frontiers of innovation. I have often pointed out that in the Philippines, there are twice as many lawyers as there are scientists and engineers. With emerging technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, which we at PIBS refer to as fire, and disruptions in production and supply chains resulting from fire, the increased globalization of labor markets are resulting in new and different sets of demands, opportunities, and challenges across SNT, especially in the next five years which we have to prepare for and anticipate. We note, however, that our study was conducted prior to the pandemic, so there may be even bigger demands now for SNT in the wake of the great reboot that our economy and society will need to do. Both the public and se the private sectors are trying to retrofit amid the, amid the new normal conditions as we continue to face the challenges posed by the ongoing pandemic. Given these possibilities, it is, is crucial for policymakers, educational institutions, as well as current and future learners to anticipate future demands in the labor market arising from these rapid changes in the world economy. Reports from the World Economic Forum, the Asian Development Bank, and the World Bank suggest that the dis disruptive changes in industry and across economies brought about by the use of emerging technologies are reconfiguring business models and demanding new skill sets for the workforce, especially for the period 2020 to 2025. While forecasts vary by industry and region, but momentous change is underway. Governments have to cope with the risks of growing technological unemployment and inequality and businesses with a shrinking consumer base. Our actions today that will determine whether change mainly results in massive displacement of workers or the emergence of new opportunities. The PIDS, in partnership with the USC SEI, has undertaken this integrated analysis of specific SNT HR requirements by mixed methods involving a literature review secondary data analysis, and some select key informant interviews with business leaders. Our secondary data analysis involved a time series analysis of data from the quarterly labor force survey from 2020, 2010 to 2018. Also, a supply estimation and demand estimation of the SNT workforce um, using, the, using data from population censuses of 2010 and 2015 as well as population projections, 
and of course, an examination of administrative data on SNP graduates from CHED, licensure examination results on SNP occupations from the PRC, and SNP government positions from DBM. As pointed out earlier, we should note that this study was undertaken prior to COVID and may not be reflective of the disruptions brought about by the current situation. The main limitation of our study is the lack of good quality data on many SNP occupations. As SNP professionals or practitioners constitute only 5% of the country's employed population, the usual sample size of the LFS or labor force survey for the period 2010 to 2018 is not sufficiently large to provide good quality estimates of the number of employed in SNP occupations. Further, labor force survey respondents need not necessarily know with certainty the detailed science and technology occupations of all household members, maybe very high groupings they could identify. Also, LFS data used in our study comprise only 36 quarters from 2010 to 2018, while time series analysis usually needs at least 50 observations to produce accurate and reliable estimates. Also, we had a structural break occurring in the LFS data due to a shift from the use of the 1992 PISOC or occupation codes to 2012 PISOC in April 2016. Anyways, given all of these limitations, we just let, like to give you an indication of main findings of the projected employment growth rates of the SNP workforce. As I mentioned, while we have a poor quality of projected employment growth rates due to the small sample size, when you look at the growth rates using uh, among ICT professionals using exponential smoothing method, the applications, programmers, and systems administrators uh, registered positive growth while computer programmers, database designers and administrators, and web-based, web and multimedia developers have negative growth rates on exp for exponential smoothing, but their average uh, uh, annual gro employment growth rates from 2016 to 2018, however, are positive. On the other hand, software developers and system systems analysts are reported to have employment contractions for both time series methods. Among engineering professionals, civil engineer is the only occupation with positive employment growth rates in exponential smoothing and annual growth rate methods, while chemical engineers, electronic engineers, and telecom engineers posted positive growth rates for exponential smoothing, but reporting negative annual growth rates for 2016 to 2018. Meanwhile, average annual growth rates for electrical engineers, environmental engineers, industrial engineers, mechanical engineers, and metallurg metallurgical engineers registered positive values um, despite having negative growth rates in ex the exponential smoothing method. The projected growth rates for game developers are lumped with web and multimedia developers. Based on the results of the analysis of the LFS data in our study, we note that the sample size in the LFS should really be increased in order to ensure good quality data for purposes of projecting future SNP human resource requirements. Furthermore, PSA should always include the, the four-digit codes uh, for cross-cutting and emerging occupations. Now, assessing the demand and supply of the STEM workforce in the Philippines is a function of responses to the needs of the changing economy. We thus looked also at data from the population censuses to profile the current labor market conditions and project supply and demand. We classified workers based on five broad fields, life sciences, physical sciences, math and statistics, computing or IT, and engineering. Based on the 2015 pop population census data, we find that there are about 5% of STEM graduates in our labor force. In terms of employment status, nearly all STEM graduates would get employment at uh, about 99.7%. Labor force participation among STEM graduates is also very high at 86.6% versus the uh, national average of 70.5%. But we notice that the labor force participation of female 
STEM graduates is lower at 72.5% when compared with that of males, 92.7%. To project the future supply of STEM workers, first it's important future STEM workers. And in the figure on the slide, we observe that the highest propensity to join the STEM fields is between the ages of 15 to 19 when they start entering the university. We also notice that computing and IT, as well as engineering fields, appear to attract more students and continue to do so in older age brackets. This reflects the popularity of these disciplines. Another important aspect for projection of the supply and, uh, is the survival rate of STEM workers. In other words, how long would they stay in the labor force? And the figure on the slide shows that the workers in mathematics and statistics leave the labor force very early at 25 to 29 years old. In contrast, workers in computing or IT continue to work even beyond retirement age. Workers from physical sciences, life sciences, and engineering follow a normal decay and retire around the age 55 to 59. Now, combining this production and survival rate information, when we came up with forecast of future supply, we found that we will continue to produce STEM workers, but the highest reduction will be for computing and IT, as well as engineering. We also know that by 2025, there will be more workers with computing or IT background than engineers. But for demand, we were able to compute for future demand by using the forecasted growth for the Philippine economy, of course, ma uh, prior to COVID, matching it with our data on worker productivity. Uh, when what we found is that the future domestic demand will be much more in favor for engineers over workers with computing or IT background. Not considering factors regarding the international labor market, we found that we are likely to have a surplus of workers in computing or IT fields in the future. Disaggregating our pro projected demand by discipline and industry, we found that most of the demand for STEM workers come from other services those that are not classified under the current uh, Philippine standard uh, uh, codes or may be too small to have a separate industry classification. These are the emerging jobs. Demand and supply projections in our study also show that by 2025, there will be an undersupply of SNT workers in life sciences, physical sciences, math and statistics, and engineering. Consequently, a need for more graduates in these discipline groups and an oversupply of workers in IT. Consequently, a need for fewer graduates in IT. Hence, it is reasonable to really plan out for more SNT graduates, but also incorporate this information. While graduates in SNT are projected to be generally increasing in SNT uh, in, in the next five years, there are factors that have impact on the attainment of these trends, increasing the enrollment and number of graduates in SNT requires the development of interest among our young on SNT and of their capabilities, as well as the reduction in the number of students in SNT who fail to graduate on time. Also, producing more graduates would not be enough to meet the projected undersupply of manpower in most SNT disciplines. We also need to consider the quality of education. Ensuring the quality of education means working for improvements in teaching quality, school facilities, and ensuring we have qualified faculty and relevant courses and degree programs. In the next slide, we list several questions or issues regarding the production of more graduates and the quality of our current SNT education. On increasing SNT enrollment and producing more graduates, first we should ask how effective is the K-12 commit the curriculum in producing students with SNT knowledge and skills? And second, how effective are our science sections and science high schools in producing SNT students? Are there enough science sections and science high schools in the country? The K-12 curriculum, science schools, and science sections expose our young to SNT. But if this uh, and if these av three avenues are effective in developing interest, skills and capabilities in SNT. Plus, of course, we have the influence of the environment, including perceived incomes from SNT jobs. Then we would be able to have higher chances of, of attracting the young into SNT degree programs. 
However, we should note that currently, unlike in Korea, we do not have a survey of what our young would like to become when they grow up. The third question is, how effective are the following in reducing the proportion of students in SNT who don't graduate on time? Things like entrance exams, IQ exams, scholarships, and financial assistance, counseling, and healthcare for students. And fourth, what methods are used to match students with degree programs and how effective are they in reducing the percentage of students who fail to graduate on time? Answers to these questions are very important because the number of students earning the SNT degrees on time directly affects the number of new graduates entering the SNT workforce. On quality of education, an indicator of the quality of education is the passing rate in professional regulatory commission examinations for the period 2012 to 2016. However, the average passing rates is lower than 50% in disciplines like marine engineering, agricultural engineering, civil engineering, electronics engineering, geodetic engineering, library science, occupational therapy, radiology uh, technology, midwifery, nursing, respiratory therapy, veterinary, veterinary medical, medicine, and geology. So the following question should be asked, do schools meet standards on school facilities, including libraries, labs, project working areas, and classrooms? Second, what is the impact of faculty development through PhD scholarships and increased pay and benefits and incentives on faculty retention? Given the re recent decreasing trend in the overall number of faculty as shown by CHED data, we will lack SNT teachers by 2022 to 2023. Third, are the current uh, SNT degree programs relevant? Two streams of studies are needed to determine relevance of these programs, tracer studies, as well as an approach used uh, by Kismorio et al. in a PIDS study, uh, assessing the Philippine alignment of Philippine higher education with the emerging demands for data science and analytics workforce. Answers to all of these questions and issues would caution the effects, the expected shocks in the labor market from fire technologies. Research studies are extremely essential to find answers to these policy questions. Our study notes that the, the government bureaucracy is the single largest employer of SNT personnel. The largest population of SNT workers are the doctors and nurses in DOH hospitals, instructors and professors in the 102 SUCs and agri-related positions in BA and DAR. SNT plantilla positions are also the majority in the DOH, DPWH, DOST, and in the Philippine Statistics Authority. The median salary grade of SNT personnel is uh, salary grade 15, which is about which is about 33,000 pesos a month. The largest unfilled, unfilled positions are those of nurses, medical doctors, and senior level professors in SUCs. An increase in vacancies is also seen for senior engineer positions in DPWH and IT personnel. Aside from current vacancies in the medical field, more nurses and doctors will also be required by government in the future as DOH hospitals expand. And also we've been feeling this in the wake of the pandemic. About half of the faculty population of SUCs are in SNT courses like agriculture and engineering. And it is also in these fields where PhD level faculty members are in very big demand. In BA and DAR, there are more than 12,000 agriculture positions, which are filled by graduates coming from 62 SOOCs offering agri related de degrees. In the D DPWH, most positions are filled except for senior level posts. And it is noteworthy that the DPWH also employs more than 30,000 contractual or project based engineers. BNR employs the most foresters and environmental science graduates in the country. DOST has over 4,000 SRS positions, in, excluding 594 uh, meteorologists in uh, Pagasa. Finally, the PSA employs more than 2,000 statisticians and, co and could possibly require even uh, another 1,000 with the implementation of the national ID program. As mentioned previously, most of the SNT positions in government, except those mentioned, uh, are in, in easily filled up, except for senior level positions with strict academic requirements. This slide shows the ideal educational attainment of personnel for various types of SNT work. 
service and laboratories would uh, require some masters, but uh, mostly bachelor's degree graduates. For research institutes, ideally, this should be a pyramid-like distribution of BS, MS, and then PhDs. Teaching at the college level, an equal uh, number of BS, uh, MS, and PhDs required. And for R&D management, such as in DOS, councils, staff members with a technical background are ideal. However, the nature of their work actually dictates a more managerial uh, background for postgrad degrees rather than an MS or PhD in SMT. The lack of applicants with MS, PhD, and management degrees has resulted in many offices removing the requirements of higher degrees for senior level positions. Putting a spotlight on the research and development institutes of DOST, their output as research institutes are comparatively lower than university-based research groups. This can be remedied by hiring more PhDs restructuring their bureaucracy and a promotion system that is based on research productivity and not in terms of years in service. To summarize, the results of our study show the need for investing in SMT human resources to prepare ourselves for the impact of technology. Our failure to invest in SMT in the past is part of the reason why we are in this uh, we are having difficulties amid the pandemic and also making a rebound. While the diverse SMT occupations differ in growth potential in terms of employment, and therefore some occupations appear more crucial than others, the fact that the total SMT workforce constitutes only a small portion, 5% of the country's workforce, underscores the need for government support for most of the SMT disciplines. Those that are marketable uh, in or, and of themselves, like industrial engineering, for example, would not need, need as much support for other fields as in other fields. Disciplines that have declining employment levels but are extremely needed to improve productivity in some sector or industry, such as those that have to do with agriculture, biology, chemistry, and possibly even chemical engineering, should be given more support by government. We provided some specific projections in the study based on the labor force survey, the pop population census and population projections and various administrative data. The great need of our economy for SMT workers to support its projected growth would require a massive boost in support for current and future SMT workforce. This cannot be attained by the government alone, but should be a joint undertaking involving the private sector as well as the academic institutions, and also the households. As regards demand, there is also a need to encourage our young to go into SMT. In the 1990s and in the early 2000s, we had television programs that tackled, that tackled SMT and mathematics, like the Big Bang Theory and Numbers. Uh, these were very great shows. Uh, show, um, that it made cu children curious about what it is to become a scientist, astronaut, mathematicians. However, we need to ad adapt to the changing times since children and housewives are, are shifting uh, from TV to YouTube, social media. So we need aggressive media campaigns, uh, particularly social media platforms like FB, uh, Instagram, and YouTube. We, we tend to use much of that. They could be used to reach to both students and parents. And it's important to make use of social media influencers, uh, poster boys and poster go girls, for advocating SNT careers. Furthermore, marketing SNT as a financial vi uh, viable career may entice parents to further boost their children to enter SNT. POST, together with DepEd, may want to seriously consider implementing an annual survey among our students regarding their dream jobs, similar to the survey implemented by Korea's Ministry of Education and Korea's Research Institute for vocational education and training. They have an annual poll on the school age dream job. In one of the Korean novellas I uh, recently watched in, on Netflix called Reply 1988, it was pointed out that Korean children in the 1970s aspired to be part of the military or government, while in the 1990s, most children, believe it or not, wanted to become scientists. These days, uh, YouTubers are now on the top list of childhood dream jobs for young Koreans since YouTubers make a lot of money. 
knowing these statistics can help uh, DOST uh, we become more strategic in advocacy campaigns, not only with the young, but with their parents. Next, it is equally important to understand factors that affect the supply and demand, uh, uh, the supply of work SNT workers. For instance, why are we having fewer female SNT graduates joining the labor force compared to males? Or why are SNT graduates, for instance, in math and statistics, exiting the labor force much earlier than other SNT graduates? Such things should be looked into in more detail in order to obtain behavioral insights and craft necessary policies to incentivize these individuals to participate actively in the economy. Furthermore, it must be noted that generally the highest propensity to join SNT is around the onset of the tertiary level, so financial support should be concentrated at this point in one's life. Furthermore, academic and research institutes must be able to produce knowledge through research. Academic must be able to develop talents and innate capabilities of students. It's important that the academic work on developing its capability for quality learning. Academic must be responsive in meeting the manpower and know-how needs of industry, government, and society. Curricula need to be regularly reviewed, revised, and old degree programs abolished with new ones developed. Research agendas of academic and research institutions need to be also reviewed and revised regularly. RDIs of DOST need reshaping to make them less structurally like a regular bureau and more like an academic institution. Forecasts of enrollment and graduates in the next few years based on growth rates show increasing trends in the number of graduates in all SNT discipline groups. Engineering and technology will be the dominant discipline groups in the next IT in the next years in terms of graduates followed by IT related disciplines. It's re recommended that an evaluations of skills taught to engineering and technology students as well as to students in IT related disciplines be undertaken to identify any mismatches between skills currently taught and skills required in the future. There may also be scope to improve not only technical, but also soft skills of our learners. A results of these studies would be adjustments in the uh, curricula and research agendas of higher educational institutions, resulting in the production of better graduates, better prepared for jobs of the future. During the 20, 41st annual scientific meeting of the NAST held on July 2019, Dr. Willie Padolina highlighted the possibility of uh, mismatches between skills of the country's graduates in SNT and the skills demanded by jobs. The country may soon be affected by developments in emerging fire technologies and there is a, a need, therefore, to assess degree programs and research agendas of HEIs on their ability and capacity to cope with technological developments and ensure that we have a set of future-ready SNT human resources that will develop a niche for the country and bring us more prosperity. That ends my presentation. Maraming salamat po. At maraming salamat din, uh, Dr. Uh, Jose Ramon Albert, for your comprehensive presentation. Friends, as we can, uh, as what we can glean from uh, the presentation of Dr. Albert, how to move forward from the issues uncovered uh, by the study requires the action and synergy of the government, the education sector, as well as the private sector. And for this reason, we invited representatives from the sector to share their, their insights. And you can see on the screen our uh, discussants. First, uh, we will hear from uh, Dr. William Padulina. Dr. William Padulina is... Uh, is an academician and former president of the National Academy of Science and Technology and former secretary of science and technology. He also served as a deputy director general of the International Research Institute and board member of the PIDS Board of Trustees. Currently, uh, Dr. Padolina is a senior fellow of the Southeast Asian Center for Graduate Studies and Research in Agriculture or CIRCA and also the chairman of the board of directors of Euromed Laboratories, Philippines Incorporated. Then uh, we will have uh, Dr. Laura David, who is the chairman of the uh, head or commission on higher education uh, technical committee for marine science and member of the technical panel on science and mathematics. 
She is a professor of oceanography and currently the director of the Marine Science Institute and a member of the National Panel of Technical Experts of the Climate Change Commission. Internationally, she is a scientific steering committee member of Geo Blue Planet and an academy member of Future Earth Hosts. After Dr. David, we will hear from our discussant from the private sector. We invited Mr. Benedict Buhai, who is the program lead of Unilev Foundation for STEM Leadership Alliance and Workforce Development. Mr. Buhain is responsible for the development, application, and implementation of the proposed Advanced Manufacturing Skills Council and Institute for Professional Workforce Development and Upskilling for Industry for Readiness. And finally, we'll also hear from the Department of Labor and Employment, or DOLE. We invited Executive Director Ama Charisma Satumba of DOLE's Institute for Labor Studies to tell us what DOLE is doing to ensure that our workforce is ready for the so-called jobs of the future. So friends, let us continue the conversation. I now give the floor to Dr. William Padolina. Sir? Uh, thank you, Sheila, for your very kind introduction. Uh, and I also like to first uh, extend my congratulations to Dr. Albert and his team for such a very important study. I suppose this should be a well wake up call for all of us. It's a very rich source of information that should be analyzed and should provide guidance to our leaders in order to prepare our country for a better future. My reaction would focus on the supply side. Next slide, please. Which will consist of some ideas about strengthening the basic sciences and mathematics, uh, revitalizing our pre-service teacher education, and graduate education reform, among other many other issues that I think we, would, we need to address. I would like to just focus on these three, which I think are going to be very critical in moving our the quality, rather, of our instruction forward. Next slide, please. I think it is very clear to us that we now face a new machine age, and Professor Bjorlofsson of MIT has characterized it as one that is digital. We need to be more quantitative. We need to know how to measure. We need to know that whatever we are able to conclude are replicable and it should be available as an open source of a zero transport cost. Also, we need to be exponential, which means we should be fast. There should be a pace of rapid development, but we still expect linear trends. And uh, thirdly, combinatorial, which means being able to develop partnerships, teams, and working with machines such as uh, our computers, and more importantly, our infrastructure systems. Next slide, please. I like to just uh, emphasize a thought from Professor Pink of Harvard, that the country's advantage comes from its choices. So it's the choices we make, it's the decisions we make, and not from the DNA of its people. Next slide, please. First, strengthening the basic sciences and mathematics. I refer to the areas of mathematics, biology, chemistry, physics, earth science, and the social sciences. The value, next slide please, of the basic sciences is quite clear. Uh, these are just few examples of how the basic sciences have, have been able to allow for more progress to be made in the transistor, in the genome map, in the new materials that we now have, and in the wireless communication that enables us now to even cope with the demands of the pandemic. Next slide, please. These are, this is a study by Dr. Ray Bea, uh, uh, which is a commission paper, 
And this shows you uh, an inventory of the number of programs in the basic sciences, um, 381 programs for the BS level, the Bachelor of Science level, 208 programs for Master of Science, and the Doctor of Philosophy, only 50. So you see the, the funneling of this, and as emphasized by Dr. Albert, we need more people for R&D and the SOOPs and the state universities and higher education uh, getting into the advanced degrees, such as the Master of Science and Doctor of Philosophy. But even the advanced countries, next slide please, where um, a lot of new technologies are being generated, you will see in these trends diagram, the emphasis that they continue to put in the basic sciences, even as they're strong in engineering and in technology, the medical sciences, they still invest a lot in physics, in the social sciences, in, in chemistry, in, in biology. And that's where the new ideas are coming from. Unfortunately, we have been lulled into believing that for as long as we are advanced or advancing in information technology, we are already good in science and technology, which is, I think, a flawed kind of mindset. Next slide, please. The next point I would like to bring up is the revitalization of free service teacher education. Next slide, please. And I will cite uh, some of the findings of Scott Manassan, uh, who did this study, I suppose, in behalf of the Asian Development Bank and reported last November 2016. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, not part of his stu her study, but just to show you that we do have a lot of repeaters taking the left, more than first timers, and their passing rates are much lower. I believe that uh, there is no limit to the number of times that you one can take the left exam. And I think this is one problem that we need to address. In my mind, why should I allow somebody who had, take, had to take the exam and pass it 10 times to teach? And that's probably one of the reasons that we're not moving very much in our basic education. This is, this is going to be the base of all of this. And unless we have we train good elementary and high school teachers who will be inspiring the students, as Dr. Albert has said, to become scientists, it's not going to work for us. You can see the results of PISA, the results of PIM, the results of SEI PLM. Uh, th these are this these are this has this have not been addressed, and we knew even more than two decades ago that we are we were not performing very well. Next slide, please. And this is what Dr. Manassan has found out: the knowledge of subject matter among elementary and high school teachers, as indicated by their performance on content knowledge diagnostic tests, is low in most subjects. And apparently, this is uh, assessed only by, by uh, a system that needs to be uh, uh, improved. And there is a need for, for high quality and regular professional development programs. Uh, as you know, I have emphasized free service training because it is too late to improve on them uh, for or in service training. And that's what we are doing. We are emphasizing in service training, which is not going to, seems not to be working very well. And yet, 
with the educational reforms that we have undertaken, we see very little adjustment in the curriculum and teaching of pre-service uh, BS in elementary education and BS in high school, uh, a secondary education. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Albert's study did not touch on this, I believe, but uh, we need to make sure that our technical vocational workforce is also well-trained. You cannot build cathedrals with architects alone. We need all of the skilled workers who will be able to implement the many good plans in putting up structures and even providing services. And again, here, uh, Dr. Manasan uh, cites a few observations on uh, the proportion of graduates that, that have been assessed, the low employability of graduates of technical and vocational educational institutes, um, the low quality of, um, of the, uh, the um, uh, training provided by TEIs reported to be more pronounced in private institutions, and the relevance of uh, technical and vocational education is held back by the limited range of course offerings. Uh, next slide, please. The next finding is very disturbing because it shows some indication that the quality of instruction in even in our higher education institution is generally low. And the, this is uh, borne out of the um, findings in the performance of the professional board exams. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this just shows you a confirmation from external resources of the weaknesses of our basic infrastructure, our health and education, and uh, even the scientific infrastructure. Uh, the next slide shows the Global Talent Competitiveness Index out of 125, with the observation what, that we have substandard formal education. Uh, this is a 2019 uh, Finding and then the third point is re envisioning. Next slide, please. And reforming our graduate education to anchor it to anchor our graduate degree programs on reputable, sustainable research expertise. I understand many of our graduate students are asked to fund their thesis. This practice has to stop because who can afford? a substantial amount out of pocket to put together a respectable study for a doctoral or a master's degree, and therefore terminate poorly performing programs and exercise caution in instituting new programs and in partnering with offshore institutions. Let us get out of the credentialization tendency to put up our graduate programs just because we need to be to have a master's degree. Uh, next slide, please. We need to actively recruit, therefore, and develop highly qualified faculty in STEM and consider hiring foreign faculty and researchers so that we can move faster this time and institute attractive compensation packages for those who are in our higher education institutions. Next slide, please. In that regard, they have to all maintain functional basic science and mathematics departments. I don't see how you can teach a good chemical engineering degree without a good chemistry department. I cannot see how you can come up with good quality engineering degrees for that matter if you do not have a physics department. Next slide, please. Provide opportunities for the faculty to retool. 
and allow them to keep up with the developments in their own discipline. Next slide, please. Establish a highly efficient research management system that will allow timely uh, deliveries of outputs and funding. And next slide. For those who are highly trained STEM staff, they should be engaged in the development of the K-12 STEM curriculum and the corresponding instructional materials. And finally, I hope we all realize that no simple law of nature makes technology the cause of economic growth or growth the cause of technological advance. It is the choices we make, the interplay of people, economic institutions, growing markets, and technologies. Thank you, and I hope uh, I have shared some thoughts for you to consider during this seminar. Thank you. And thank you very much to Dr. Uh, Padulina. You have, um, you have underscored very important points on the value of research in the basic sciences, the need to improve uh, teacher competencies, develop and recruit um, qualified faculty in STEM, enhance the quality of instruction and other essential recommendations. Um, friends, let's continue our conversation. And uh, at this point, I would like to call on uh, Dr. Laura David, who is representing the Commission in Higher Education. We hope uh, Dr. David can share with us the initiatives being done by SHED on uh, uh, areas like faculty development, curriculum improvement, promotion of STEM courses, and other uh, key measures, um, not only to increase our pool of S&T graduates, but also to come up with quality S&T graduates. Dr. David? Hello, Sheila. Um, yes, ma'am. So if I may share my slides, please. Kita niyo po ba ang aking slides? Yes, ma'am. Kita na? Okay. Um, okay. So, I, I I am approaching. So, I'm very thankful for the study that was conducted because it shows us um, a stock take stock-taking effort of what we have currently and all the issues that are associated with the uh, slow SNT development. But I would like to take you on a journey of um, visioning. So beyond stock-taking, we should have a visioning of where we want to go. And, and um, I'll do this by example because I think visioning does not, uh, does not always uh, mean that we will do exactly what our neighbors are doing or what the developed countries are doing, but actually leapfrogging beyond what they're doing right now. So one way to do this is to take a look also, take stock, what is happening all over the world that has impact on us nationally, but has also impact internationally. So one thing that uh, we've been pushing for is for people to realize that we only have around 60 years um, of uh, reliable oil and gas research. Okay, so if we put that into our mind, then we know where we have to go, uh, SNT wise. So SNT wise, um, we've, we're already way ahead of our neighbors actually, because we started with geothermal and hydroelectric dams uh, when there was first a, a worry that we won't be able to access the fossil fuels of the Middle East. So we started churning out our own development, s &T, to make use of our own resources, hydroelectric and geothermal. So even before all this climate change, um, all the push for renewable energy, we were doing that because we recognize a problem. Um, now we're also investing in electricity um, from wind and from solar. But there are two things that I'd like to point out with this slide. One is none of these are climate resilient, meaning if there are no rainfall, you will not have, uh, if there are a lot of rainfall, you will not have solar. If there's no wind, there's no electricity from windmills. And if there's no rainfall, you don't have hydroelectric dams and even your geothermal power plants will be compromised um, because you need that water for steam. The other thing is because we were so early on already doing geothermal and hydroelectric, at the moment, 
our scientists, our engineers who are doing geothermal are actually being imported by South America, for example, because the technology here is already very mature. So we're one of the leads in that. So now we're being imported, our s and in geothermal is being imported in other countries so that they can now, because of climate change, harness their geothermal energy. Okay, so that's what I want to point out. We did that. So now what, what else can we do? Since we're in our capelagic country, we can also make use of our ocean resources. And there's so many different types. Um, here, for example, we're pushing for uh, tidal uh, currents because you can predict that. Um, it's easy to, to maintain um, uh, all the paddles or the board turbines are in shallower water, so it's easier to maintain. Uh, and we have a lot of constrictions in between islands, so you have uh, jets going through between islands which you can harness. And beyond just harnessing this, we can leap to other production and other uses like greening or using renewable energy for our vehicles. So not just a cars, but e, like here, e-banka, no? e-boats, uh, even e-submarines that you can make use of uh, renewable energy from the ocean to run. And then you go beyond that because you have the bankas and all that, you need to do science in uh, um, biofouling, science in corrosion testing. Uh, you also want to monitor who's coming or, and going so you can do remote sensing under, in, in, underwater. You can do uh, deep water mariculture instead of uh, keeping our mariculture near the coastal areas. So with the, gen, with the energy that you generate, you can actually make other industries and therefore, you need all the science and technology for that. Right now, there are 32 SUCs in the Philippines that focus in the marine environment. So they either have a bachelor, master's, or PhD in marine science, or marine biology, or biology major in marine. So what we can do is we can uh, see which technology development, s and development, is good for certain areas. And that can be their niche. Not everybody needs to go to UP, for example. No? So if, you, if a certain area is developed for a specific uh, SNT, then they can all go there. So if MSU Iligan, for example, will be good for um, tidal in-stream energy, then if I'm a, a student, I would want to go there to do my master's in, in electricity. Uh, so, and then, uh, but at the same time, I don't want the piecemeal development. It can't be just Siliman will develop and then MSU IIT will develop. There also has to be a harnessing of all of this because what you want is to drive national economy to, to have employability locally and also internationally of all of this s and development. So we should also have something like a Marine Innovative Te Technology Testing Ses Center, maybe one in Luzon, Visayas, Mindanao, or just one to start with where all this technology uh, initially tested on a pilot scale in each of these SUCs can then test it for a um, commercial scale. You know? So they don't have to have their own areas where they can develop it. There's this s and Center, Marine Innovative Center, where people can come and test out their thesis, their dissertation at a bigger scale, at a more commercial scale. Um, this way, we, we can also attract possible investors from all over, not just the Philippines, and possible also s and developers who can do their testings here. Um, and I think that's important because there are areas, for example, like Orkney in UK, that is now a marine technology testing center for ocean energy, but their oceans are not like our oceans. There's this very noisy, higher wave, higher waves, stronger currents, so it won't be good to test what we develop here, there. But there are a lot of tropical countries who have the same oceans as us. So if we have so something like this, then we attract all of those, no? all, all of the tropical world to come to us to develop technology for the marine environment. Um, and I agree with, with Dr. Padolina, Kadimushin Padolina, that um, we have to start therefore with our faculty 
kasi kaya na teach what you do not know. So it doesn't mean that they have to redo everything, but they have to retool, research, collaborate with other people that are doing this. Uh, as they progress in their research, that's how they can share with their students. And then how can they, they specialize uh, and develop a niche in their own SUC or HEI. Um, and another thing that I wanted to point out, that's why there's this table, one thing that is um, a hindrance to us hiring uh, more faculty to our SUCs is two things. One is that rule that it, they have to be Filipino. And the other one is this, which um, if you take a look at the table, there's so many requirements. So even if I'm already a PhD, um, I have to have in addition eight years relevant experience um, in teaching 40 hours relevant experience in some sort of training. Uh, I have to demonstrate significant contribution to the community in development before I'm given, I'm hired as a professor. Otherwise, even with a PhD degree, I'm hired as an assistant professor because I don't have all the other ticks. But this is limiting to us. No, you, you, when you graduate with your PhD, the young people who graduate with their PhD now, they don't always have all of these, but they do have a PhD degree, they do have publications, and they're rearing to go and do research and teach. So we have to go back to this. This is a DBM circular of um, telling uh, SUCs on, and HAIs on the requirement of hiring, basically SUCs because it's a DBM. Um, but, but I think this is limiting us. I, ha I have, for example, students who have finished either in UP or in UP tandem in, another, in other universities abroad, and they come back and they're given assistant professor too. That's an insult, I think, because, and, and they end up not wanting to stay uh, because of that treatment. So um, this, this has to be looked into and studied further. And I thank the, the um, team for doing the research for us. Uh, perhaps you can also take a look at this. In the end, I think uh, science is, has to be for societal benefit. And if we can show um, parents, I think parents uh, push their, their kids to do engineering and, and medical profession uh, in, uh, instead of science in itself because of two things. They think it, uh, they earn better and they think they serve society more. I think we should show the society that our science is actually benefiting the entire society. Then we will have more parents um, pushing their kids or at least supporting their kids when their kids want to go into the scientific field. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. David. Before I call our next uh, discussion, someone wants to say hi to all of us. Um, Secretary uh, Fortunato de la Peña, Secretary Boy. Yes, yes, I just wanted to uh, greet you live because uh, uh, we had a, uh, a uh, event, an event with the Ministry of Science and Technology of China uh, from two to three. And uh, so I could not deliver my uh, message live, and so it was delivered as a uh, recorded uh, message. But I just want to let you know that I have uh, joined your uh, webinar now, and uh, I will be listening. So I just want to uh, thank everyone who organized this uh, webinar and uh, who participated in the research, uh, in the study, and also the resource person that we have now. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Secretary Boy. Good that uh, you are now with us in this uh, activity. So uh, moving on. Okay, so uh, friends, um, the study emphasized uh, the need for government to um, work with the private sector and the academy in supporting SNT human resource development in the country. And this afternoon, we will hear from Mr. Benedict Buhain of uh, Unila Foundation about the initiatives 
of the Foundation on STEM Education and Workforce Development for Industry 4.0. Mr. Buhain, now have the floor, sir. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Sheila. Uh, good afternoon, Secretary de la Peña. Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank, uh, of course, PIDF for giving Unilab Foundation this opportunity to participate in this webinar. And um, this afternoon, uh, I'd like to do this presentation about one of our initiatives uh, called SYSTEM. And I think this is really a good connection to the earlier uh, presentation made by Dr. Uh, Albert and Dr. Padolina and uh, also Dr. David. So uh, Unilab Foundation has uh, been one of the prime movers to put together uh, an organization called SYSTEM, which is the Center for Integrated uh, STEM Education. And uh, SYSTEM is, was envisioned to create a culture of inquiry and innovation uh, for nation building here in the Philippines. Next slide. So this started as an independent program of Unilab Foundation. Um, as recently as two years ago, we uh, sent a team of uh, uh, educators from the University of the Philippines, the Department of Education, and the Philippine Science High School uh, system to a global benchmarking tour and training uh, in the United States. And, and you know, we partnered with um, uh, companies like the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology in order to do this uh, uh, initial benchmarking tour. Next slide, please. So system is governed by an international advisory board. Uh, we have a very diverse set of uh, individuals. Um, you can see uh, people such as uh, Dr. Lance Bush from the Challenger uh, Center, uh, Professor Vijay Kumar, who is with the uh, MIT JWell uh, program. He's the Associate Dean for Open Learning in MIT. We also have um, Dr. Levin from the uh, World Bank and Dr. Dubosarski from the uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. One of the uh, key partnerships that we also have made uh, within SYSTEM is with the STEM Leadership Alliance in the US and uh, their uh, founder, uh, Ms. Kelly List-Wells is also on our advisory board. Next slide, please. And uh, we also have, of course, uh, Dr. Uh, Ethel Valenzuela from uh, the CIMEO, uh, very active in our board together with Dr. Monterola from AIM, Dr. Marciano from uh, UP Diliman, uh, Dr. Uh, Sumida, as well as uh, Dr. Ruban. So very broad international advisory board. And we also have, next slide, please. A board of trustees uh, from uh, government, uh, industry, and uh, and academe. Uh, we have from uh, UP Diliman, Dr. Nemenzo, from CIARCA, Dr. Gregorio, Dr. Serafica, uh, Science and Technology Innovation Builder, uh, and also from Unilab, and Ms. Ben Coronel, who is uh, the CEO and founder of Point West Technologies Corporation. Next slide. System has a dedicated team of individuals uh, led by Dr. Uh, Cheryl Monterola from the uh, UP College of uh, Education. It's a small but growing team and hopefully we see this team um, expanding as we pursue more projects uh, through system. Next slide, please. So in system, our aim is to establish integrated STEM education in the Philippines and I guess I'd like to focus on, on the term integrated through its uh, various strategic programs. And uh, we have five programs uh, that start with teacher upskilling, which I guess is one of the key areas identified by the uh, previous presenters as being one of the critical uh, challenges that we have to deal with in order to improve the quality and delivery of education in the Philippines. Another strategic program involves learner empowerment. Of course, um, integrated STEM and its delivery need to be learner-centric. Um, uh, 
And I'll discuss more about that uh, in my uh, later slides. The third program that we have uh, addressed within system is curricular innovation. So this is another uh, challenge that was identified by the previous uh, presenters. And uh, Unilab Foundation and system, really we, we see ourselves really as being uh, coalition alliance uh, partnership builders. So we, we feel definitely that the integration of government, industry, and education is a key ingredient in order for us to successfully deliver our uh, objectives in integrated STEM education. Last but not least, our fifth uh, area of strategic uh, interest is in the area of research. Uh, now let me discuss uh, in greater detail each of these um, strategic programs. Uh, in the area of teacher upskilling, uh, system has been um, delivering various uh, webinars in partnership, of course, with the uh, DepEd uh, and also with its accredited, uh, um, uh, we are also the accredited uh, training arm of the uh, NAAP. And uh, you can see that we've had, uh, of course, because of the pandemic, a lot of these webinars have been delivered uh, virtually. And uh, to date, we have reached uh, over 130,000 participants in the various uh, webinars that the uh, system has uh, delivered. And we're also proud of the fact that we have a very high engagement rate. Out of the uh, total number of participants, uh, roughly around 25% have led to higher levels of interaction uh, after the webinars were um, concluded. And of course, these webinars, we made these in partnership with the uh, CNE Publishing, which is also one of the members of our um, uh, broad uh, alliance coalition. Next slide, please. Again, uh, further in the area of teacher upskilling, we believe that uh, innovation workshops are all also a very effective tool uh, to um, help develop uh, teachers' uh, skills. In particular, uh, we held uh, recently, uh, fourth quarter, third quarter of last year, an online innovation workshop for various uh, members of the University of the Philippines uh, system with a very broad scope and coverage of uh, topics. Next slide, please. So again, on teacher upskilling, we also do a lot of design thinking workshops for education, in particular partnering with the Philippine Science High School, UP NISMED, and also with the DepEd, uh, particularly in the division of Sorsogon, where we've been um, doing a lot of pilot projects. Uh, we have done this in partnership with Bayan Academy and also Emerson, who are partners of our uh, STEM Leadership Alliance uh, Coalition in the Philippines. Next slide, please. We also have uh, put up a STEM teaching factory, which is essentially a teacher immersion program with a particular focus on integrated STEM careers. Something again that was mentioned in the previous presentation. And we've uh, reached out to two of our sister companies within the Unilab group uh, for this, uh, in particular Amherst uh, Laboratories. And even within Unilab itself, we have what we refer to as a pharma academy. So this is actually uh, uh, an academy that uses a lot of uh, TVET and upskilling programs uh, for uh, young recent uh, graduates who enter uh, the Unilab uh, company and are uh, just about to pursue their uh, career in uh, pharmaceuticals. Next slide, please. In the area of learner empowerment, uh, since 2019, we've been uh, delivering various summer programs. You can see that this really focuses on introducing integrated STEM to very young learners. Uh, we, we really believe that STEM is something that needs to be planted very early on uh, so that children, even at a very young age, can be exposed and uh, given a very good uh, idea of possibly what they can 
learn what they can expect to do later on in life in the field of integrated uh, science and uh, technology. Next slide, please. Further to that, uh, in particular, we're working with the uh, division of uh, DepEd in Sorsogon. We have also uh, implemented various hackathon and STEAM innovation uh, competitions. Uh, let me uh, clarify uh, this term uh, STEAM. Uh, in particular, you'll note that the insertion of the letter A uh, here actually refers to the area of agriculture, which is something that we feel is uh, pretty much a critical area that needs to be uh, urgently stemified uh, in the Philippines so that we can improve the quality as well of, us, of our agricultural uh, production and competitiveness and competitiveness with other uh, ASEAN nations. Next slide, please. So for learner empower, empowerment, we have uh, published various uh, uh, research outputs in this particular area. And uh, in particular, we're also uh, working with other uh, stakeholder groups who are looking at how these outputs can be applied, not just in a rural setting, but also in an urban setting. And, uh, we are about to embark on a, a new project uh, with, with uh, other stakeholder groups to, to look into how urban uh, farming can really be uh, scaled up, uh, particularly here within the national capital region. Again, something that was very much brought to the public's attention due to the uh, effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. One of the things that uh, we also uh, introduced in order to uh, capture the attention of young learners is to talk about the pandemic, I guess, in a way that they could easily relate to. So. Uh, we actually uh, had uh, an information drive about uh, COVID-19 and, of course, the proper safety and hygiene practices. And we delivered this through a comic book format, which is something, I guess, that the young children really appreciated. So this is really a, a good way to communicate the vital importance of uh, good uh, uh, health practices and hygiene practices during this time of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So as mentioned earlier, even in the area of urban uh, agriculture, we came out with various uh, publications in partnership with the Department of Agriculture, uh, particularly their training institute, to introduce ur urban farming to uh, very young learners, as you can see from the materials. Next slide, please. In the area of curricular innovation, which is something that uh, was discussed earlier, uh, in particular, we went uh, to the most basic level uh, of K-12, which is K-2. to And uh, we wanted to introduce science very early on through various modules that could be uh, deployed even for remote learning. Uh, we created a laboratory in a box. We offered tutorials as well for the parents who are the home learning partners. And we use social media to reach out to these uh, various stakeholder groups. Next slide, please. Again, uh, looking at the uh, initiative that we have with DepEd, uh, particularly in the area of Sorsogon, uh, we introduced a STEAM innovation program with various stakeholders working with different communities, understanding their needs and ideating so that we could come up with relevant outputs that could be very useful for the needs of the particular uh, area and geography. Next slide, please. We also believe as well, uh, definitely as Dr. Padolina pointed out, the area of PVET is something where it is uh, critical to also stemify uh, PVET. So in partnership with the International Labor Organization and TESDA, we've helped develop their curriculum and also a train the trainers workshop. Uh, and we also anticipate doing uh, other future activities uh, so that uh, we can further um, cement this uh, uh, program within uh, the PVET uh, area. Next slide, please. Um, in Trimedia, we are using both television, uh, print and radio to introduce 
uh, what we refer to as the Wonder Science Program. We have uh, a very interesting uh, personality, Teacher Melvin, that can easily relate to uh, children within the junior high school level. Next slide, please. So these, uh, this will just give you a sense of how Trimedia can be a very powerful tool for us and channel to reach uh, broader uh, audiences and introduce STEM, uh, integrated STEM to, uh, to them. We're doing this also in partnership with the Ateneo uh, uh, SALT uh, program. Next slide, please. Very recently, uh, in partnership with Simeo, MIT Jewel, we co-organized and hosted the second Integrated STEM Leadership Summit in Asia. Very successful uh, summit. We had uh, 3,770 participants. And uh, this was done over a two-day period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Buhain. It's actually very inspiring to know that we have programs like the ones you mentioned that are uh, led by the private sector for s and development. Uh, you have shared with us uh, valuable examples of private sector initiatives, which hopefully could motivate other companies to follow suit. At this point, I now give the floor to Executive Director Satumba of Dollars Institute for Labor Studies for the Institute's comments and reactions. Edi Cha. Okay, magandang hapon sa ating lahat. Uh, Dr. Sheila, thank you very much. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the PIDS, uh, of course, Dr. Celia Reyes and her team for this opportunity to share our thoughts and insights. And I'd like to congratulate Dr. Albert and the entire research team for the conduct of the study. Kailangan po talaga namin itong mga pag-aaral na ganito, no? especially now that we are anticipating not only the possible uh, adverse effects of technological advancement, but the future of work, no? the fast-changing world of work because of uh, technology, climate change, and changing demographics. So we really need to look uh, at the current and future workforce to prepare them for the possible effects of the fourth industrial revolution. Since the studies anchored on the disruptions associated with the fourth IR, please allow me to first share with you several initiatives from the DOLE with respect to gearing up for the Industry 4.0, with the end in view of supporting sustainable and decent jobs across all industries, not only in the science and technology uh, uh, sector. So next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. As a general policy thrust in relation to the challenges and opportunities brought about by the Industry 4.0, the dollar is preparing the workforce through skills development skills qualifications and alignment, ensuring up-to-date labor market information and timely policy research and advocacy. Hence, the department is engaged in the following relevant endeavors. Next slide, please. In collaboration with PESDA, PTI, CHED, and DepEd, we are currently working towards the development of a skills framework and a roadmap for Industry 4.0 to prepare workers for in-demand jobs in the future through lifelong learning. DOLET, together with the said agency, started a partnership with the Singaporean government, which has a robust policy on lifelong learning and development of skills for the future through its Skills Future Singapore program. Next slide. We'd also like to uh, inform you that the TESDA already formulated the National Technical Education and Skills Development Plan 2018 to 2022, where DOL is an active member. No? And this plan incorporates strategies and interventions to adapt the workforce to the demands of the fourth industrial revolution. Among the salient strategies and interventions of the plan are the following. Uh, number one, creation of a conducive and enabling environment for the development and quality service delivery of the Tibet sector. So yung mga issues po na na-mention kanina ay uh, ma-address nitong plano na ito. Uh, number two, ensuring that industries with economic and employment growth potentials are provided with the required quantity of and quality of workers. And of course, uh, number three, preparation of the Philippine workforce for the challenges posed by the fourth industrial revolution. Next slide. Um, also, the dollar together with other uh, agencies has contributed to the, to, to the enhancement of the education and employment linkage system in the country 
by proactively advocating for the institutionalization of the Philippines Qualifications Framework, which culminated in the enactment into law of Republic Act Number no. 10968 in 2018. Ano po ba ang ibig sabihin ng Philippines Qualifications Framework or PQF? No? The PQF is a quality assured national system for the development, recognition, and award of qualifications based on, on standards of knowledge skills and values acquired in different ways and methods by learners and workers. So meron na rin pong ASEAN uh, qualifications framework at isa po tayo sa uh, miyembro ng ASEAN na, na meron na nito. No? Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, uh, kanina may mga na-mesyo si Dr. Albert that we need to actively involve the private sector employers in terms of providing a uh, skills training to in-house skills training to our to their employees no so the job skills the job start philippines program um, uh, wants to uh, do that no and it's actually helping uh, in, in that area so uh, the job start philippine program uh, was uh, with a pilot test in 2014 to 2015 and institutionalized in 2016 through republic act number 108869 helps the youth to be more employable through a full cycle employment facilitation framework that involves the following. Okay, so my life skills training shall with one-on-one -on -one career coaching, technical training, job matching, and, re and, and referrals to partner employers, either for further technical training, internship, or for decent employment. Partner employers design and implement training plans for in-house technical training of job start beneficiaries and later on provides them with job experience in an actual workplace through internship. Okay, next slide. We also have the Dollars Career Guidance Advocacy Program. This aims to immerse parents and students on the realities of the labor market and convince career advocates to use career guidance as an effective tool in addressing job skills mismatch. To expand the reach of the program in response to the demands of the fourth industrial revolution, the department with the Bureau of Local Employment is developing the enhanced career guidance and employment coaching modules and a site no, where self-taught modules can be accessed by interested stakeholders. So this will include modules on life skills, LMI, basic productivity, and other information materials from relevant government agencies such as DepEd, CHED, PESDA, DOST, and PRC. Next slide. Okay. So in light of the developments and changes in the labor market, uh, the ILS has conducted a series of dialogue with our traditional tripartite partners, as well as other important civil society actors on the theme, shaping the discourse on the future of decent work. The dialogue series has provided a platform for all stakeholders, including the youth, to raise awareness on the risks and opportunities of digitalization in our work workplaces, and agree based on the mutual understanding of the issues to policy recommendations that gear towards strengthening the fundamental principles of decent work amid a fast-changing world of work. Next slide. Lastly, as cited in the PIDS study being discussed in this event, the DOLI through the Bureau of Local Employment released in 2018 the Jobs Fit 2022 Labor Market Information Report, which identifies various industries that are projected to create jobs, okay, as well as the corresponding skills to be needed in the Philippines by 2022. However, uh, the coronavirus crisis has hastened no, the future of work and thus the said report has to really be updated. So in November 2020, the DOLIB BLE published the Jobs with COVID-19 LMI report to tackle how the COVID-19 pandemic is reshaping the Philippine labor market and what are the consequent changes in the future skills needs. Okay. So now allow me to share insights on the findings and recommendations of the research relative to the human resource requirements of the Philippine science and technology sector. Uh, next slide. Um, okay. I will focus on three aspects of the study's recommendations. Number one, on encouraging the young population to go into SNP fields. Number two, on scholarships and future employment of SNP graduates. And number three, on understanding other factors that affect the supply of SNP workers. Next slide, please. The very millennial recommendation of encouraging the youth to go into SNP fields via social media platforms and influencer is a really a brilliant idea. Nonetheless, we believe that there are also other fundamental concerns that we need to address regarding the matter. So, foremost of which is on how to start them young. No? 
or how we can build up the interest and reinforce the learning capacity of students on math and science, which bolsters their propensity to choose SNT related fields as their professional careers later on. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So generally speaking, alam naman po natin na pag science and technology subjects, lalo na mathematics, no, are dreaded by many students from elementary up to the tertiary level. But a deeper reflection points to the observation of scholars that many children show clear interest in math and science in their primary grades. But such interest declines significantly in the succeeding grades. So this is hardly surprising as concepts and theories in science and math subjects get more complex and consequently more difficult to comprehend as students climb up the educational ladder. Therefore, the policy issue is not only limited to fostering positive attitude of elementary students towards math and science, but the greater policy challenge is how to maintain their interest on the said subjects up to the tertiary level. Okay, next slide. So a simple yet uh, profound recommendation is to make the teaching enhanced learning of math and science fun from grade school up to college. So if you have mga participants po, was, uh, was it fun for you to learn math and science? Or was it uh, a burden? <laughs> so, so, yun. so next slide. And of course, uh, we have uh, different uh, uh, innovative teaching methods naman. Ano? And uh, maganda yung kanina mga minensyon ni Mr. Buhain. And let's learn from their group. No? Napaka-innovative nung kanilang uh, learning methodologies. Okay. Uh, next slide. So aside from making the teaching of science, math, and fun, there is also a need to reinforce the learning capacity of all students in the said subjects. Specifically, given the complexity of concepts and theories in math and science subjects, there will be students who will really fall behind in the learning process and will have low, if not failing grades. We must accept this fact and think of ways to address the problem. Next slide. So one, pos one possible strategy is for the government to invest in remedial education that helps improve the academic performance of low achieving students to be at par with the expected level of their academic years. So this can be done by institutionalizing the establishment and maintenance of learning resource centers, not just among all state universities and colleges, but among all public high schools and elementary schools. Next slide. So halimbawa po na marami tayong models like yung sa UP system, yung Diliman Learning Resource Center nila is really a great example. No? It offers free peer assisted tutorials in mathematics. So um, elementary students uh, in high school are able to learn algebra, trigonometry, calculus, chemistry, physics, biology, um, uh, with the help of uh, other students. So, kaya, kaya malaking bagay kung institutionalize yung mga learning resource center. Hindi na siya parang library, but really interactive. No? Next slide. Okay. So, uh, we also recognize the need for financial assistance or scholarships to encourage high school students to enroll in SNT courses when they enter college. So, sinabi nga ni Dr. Albert no, that the government is the single largest employer of SNT graduates in the country. Next slide. So, to this end, a uh, possible policy action may come in the form of two pronged approach. First, we encourage natin yung mga government agencies na uh, merong need for workforce with SNT background to provide scholarships to undergraduate students taking SNT courses. So, parang nandun pa lang sila sa kolehiyo, inaalagaan na natin sila. Okay? And uh, hindi lang sana DOST ito, kundi pwede rin yung DOH, CHED, or DA, or DAR, DPWH, DNR, and PSA, no, etc. Next slide. Okay. So pwede rin i-consider yung mga um, uh, scholarship grants na from scholar to staff. Um, ewan ko kung if this is possible, no? pero um, we're just putting it uh, forward na uh, pwede sa mga uh, graduating college students, uh, sabihin na natin yung mga vacancies natin and, and if they're interested, we can offer this uh, scholarship so that um, win-win situation siya. Ma usually kasi itong SNT uh, 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 human resources, no? it's e e both in, dem in demand but hard to fail. Okay? So win-win siya kasi uh, meron ka ng prospect. No? Ito na train mo na siya. So mas mabilis yung school to work transition. Okay? And then last slide. I know, hindi pa pala last slide. Next slide, okay. So, lastly, we agree that we need to look into other factors that affect the supply of SNT workers. Um, maraming minensya si Dr. Albert, no, na, na 
mga areas like gender disparity, labor force participation, and intra-industry differences in labor market uh, outcomes. No? And uh, we are willing to, next slide, we are really willing to work with the IDS on follow-up studies uh, uh, in this regard. And, and finally, um, aside from you know, increasing the, the number of SNP graduates, I would like to emphasize the importance of life skills. Uh, kasi based on the serving namin sa mga employers, uh, while they need technical um, uh, skills, mas importante pa rin sa kanila ang life skills, no? leadership, communication, strategic thinking, no? analytical thinking. So for this graduate, for this uh, science and technology, technology graduates to thrive in a really fast changing world of work, buka nga, di ba, in a buka world. So pwede kasi yung graduate sila may technical skills sila, pero kung wala silang leadership skills, wala silang medyo mahina yung critical thinking, yung analytical thinking, yung interpersonal skills, uh, baka mag-stagnate din yung kanilang career. So important din talaga yung life skills sa pagtuturo natin. And uh, maganda na nandito ang... Yes, da, ang GED, ang DepEd, because <clears throat> lahat tayo ay uh, kailangan makatulong doon sa pag-provide sa kanila ng life skills. So, yun lang po at maraming salamat. Maraming salamat, uh, E.B. Chas, sa tuba of uh, Dolles uh, Institute for Labor Studies. Very uh, valuable insights uh, that you shared with us. Uh, I was particularly drawn to your uh, last point on developing the life skills among our workforce. Napaka-importante nga, nga nun, ma'am. And of course, your other recommendations. Um, well, at this point, um, um, we, we thank all our discussants uh, for uh, whose uh, presentations, whose insights provided more substance and context, and context to our discussion this afternoon. Friends, before we go to the op open forum, I would like to announce that we won't have a poll today. But we will pick uh, two WebEx participants, and each of them will uh, receive a PIDS notebook as our, as our incentive. I will announce their names before we close the webinar. So let us now proceed to the open forum. And at this point, may I invite our presenter, as well as our discussants, and uh, the, um, the other authors of the study to join the open forum. OK? So. Um, First, let me start with the with questions related to the study. And we have here a question from um, a basic question from Mr. Roberto Cabardo about the margin of, of error of the study based on the sample. Foods, you mentioned a while ago that one of the limitations of the study. You mentioned a while ago uh, one of the limitations of the of the study, uh, um, your source, uh, the, the data which you use, which is the labor force uh, survey. Toots, uh, can you uh, help us answer the question of uh, Mr. Uh, Roberto? Mr. Roberto Cabardo. Toots? Okay. Thanks, Sheila. First, uh, regarding this question, uh, just a uh, top of mind calculation that I made because the labor force survey has about 40,000 samples. Uh, and of which, if uh, as we mentioned, only 5% of the labor force, of course, not everybody's in the labor force. There are also people who are, who are not in the labor force. But uh, suppose if you're, you're just thinking of the 40,000, you think 5%, that's uh, 1,200. And, and the usual uh, thing that we associate with 1,200 for, for, for calculating a, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the, a, a national survey, where you're estimating proportions, that would lead to um, a three percentage margin of error. But because because you're calculating growth rates, not changes from one period to another, so I would say that you would th th there would be like a six percentage points error. But that's for the aggregate. No, <laughs> that's the aggregate result. So when you start drilling down to the different uh, disciplines, then of course the 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 margins of errors will become bigger, and that's why we were already putting a warning that that whatever results we're making there you know they should be said with a grain of salt uh so of course but Anna Tabunda, you might want to uh, uh, ask her because she was the one who who did uh, many more of the the calculations here thank you to hey. dr tabunda please okay the Anna. Uh, 
Yes. <clears throat> Good afternoon. As uh, Toots explained, the error margin will be large and it will be different for each of the uh, occupations that I look at. Um, so we were only looking at um, the results as indicative, which is why we were comparing the, um, the forecasts based on two methods, which are very simple, really, exponential smoothing method and the uh, average growth rates. But um, in the case of the uh, projections for the supply and demand, which um, was done by Chris and was based on the census, okay, that one has no uh, error margin in theory. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Tabunda and Dr. Albert. Now let us uh, jump to the next question, which is from Ruth Politico, also related to the study. Is there an, attrition, an estimated attrition rate among S&T labor for spe uh, specifically life sciences subfield? Uh, you mentioned in one of your slides the survival rate of S, uh, STEM graduates. And uh, you found there that for computing and IT, well, there's no problem there because uh, computing and IT graduates work even beyond uh, the retirement age. But for certain s and fields, like let's say uh, mathematics and uh, statistics as at, as at a certain age, no? Uh, 25 to 29. 20, yeah, 25 to 29, ano na sila, they exit the labor force. Saan sila pumupunta? May replacement bang nangyayari? Well, or, well, the thing is, we, we when when you say they exit the labor force, that means they're not employed or un, they're not un, unemployed. They're not. They're they probably might be uh, <clears throat> uh, getting out by because baka nanganak, baka kinasal, you know, and then ah, hindi okay. na hindi na pumuyek, no, naging how, uh, permanent housewife. Uh, kasi yun yung usual na not in the labor force. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so they mm -hmm. they don't go back anymore because maybe it's uh, even harder for pag nanganak yung babae especially no pag nanganak siya it's harder for them to to go back you know especially if you're in, in a field that's fast growing uh, like SNT I mean you, the changes oh. not fast growing but the the changes in what you should know <laughs> uh so it's it's harder okay. to get fully employed Okay, and this is a concern, ano, kasi these are the fields, no, na talagang kailangan natin. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, and you mentioned about uh, in, in one of your, uh, in, in your presentation that uh, in terms of women taking or entering into s and uh, fields or entering into the s and track, mas kokonti ang mga babae, no? Yeah. And, um, how do we encourage more women kaya to take or enter into um, STEM, no? As um, s and track, no? Perhaps we can ask the other discussants uh, on this. Uh, any thoughts or uh, may I ask first uh, one of you, one of your co-authors, si, ano, si Dr. Anna, and then we can, oh, oh kasi babae siya. <laughs> Baka may, may, meron siyang maibigay sa atin na insights. Ma'am? How can we encourage more females to go into STEM? Um, are you there? Yes, I, I think I think uh, it will have to really start from from basic education. Okay, where it's the same for uh, encouraging males and females. Maybe what we need to consider is how do we encourage the females to stay into the in 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 the STEM. Uh, positions. Um, mm -hmm. It will have to be through economic incentives as well. Although there will always be that subset that will prioritize their their homemaking, um, uh, their home as their priority. But if mm -hmm. we can have more uh, female um, STEM graduates, then okay, even yes. if we have some subset not entering the labor force or dropping out early, we still have a substantial portion in there. Okay. Uh, um, if I may ask uh, Mr. Buhayin, because you you, uh, you you um presented your system uh program, um, do you provide uh, 
does the does the program provide scholarships and do you prioritize or give um incentives for for uh female students to to go into stem may ganun pa sa, sa system ng unilab foundation yes well through unilab foundation and our stem leadership alliance we have uh some partnerships with the uh, Philippine Business Coalition for Women Empowerment. And we also are looking into offering some scholarship programs in partnership with, uh, um, you know, organizations uh, that are very focused on uh, getting women into coding and software development. But, you know, to, to answer your question quite plainly, the best way to encourage um, women and specifically young girls to get into STEM is to really recognize the fact that they're, they're, you know, if you look at grade four students, and I think I, I sent you a slide on this uh, previously, the Filipina girls consistently outperform Filipino boys in reading math and science. And uh, that's, that's something I think that we have to encourage because uh, the, the thing about integrated STEM is you're connecting what they're learning and eventually what types of career pathways they can get into. So, so, yeah, if you want to encourage that that inclination and that desire to get into uh, STEM, you have to show them what what it will look like possibly for them later on in life. You know what types of professions, careers, and occupations they uh, they can get into. I'll just share this quick example in our second integrated uh, STEM uh, leadership summit that we held uh, very recently. One of our keynote speakers is the, um, she's an astronaut and she is the first educator in space. Uh, so, so, so for, you know, for Filipina girls to hear from role models like that, um, you know, gives them an inspiration to really get into STEM and pursue STEM careers uh, for the long term. Thank you, uh, Mr. Buhain. I see another question related to the study in the chat box, but let me jump first. I'll go back to that, to a question which is uh, policy-related, uh, uh, and this is from uh, Maria Lourdes Mendoza. And if I may um, throw this question to uh, Dr. Padulina, sir, um, here is the here is the the question: Are government science schools like the Philippine Science High School encourage students to pursue S and P courses in college? Uh, I understand these schools have a policy that if graduates pursue courses other than S and T, they have to return the tuition fee subsidized by government. Will a strict implementation of this policy help increase the number of students who will pursue S and P course, courses or practice? Uh, What's your take on this, uh, Dr. Padulina? Sir? Don't, Sir Padulina? Don't yes. Yes, sir. Did you hear uh, what I said, sir? Can you hear me? Sir? Yes, sir. We can hear you now, Paul. Okay. Okay. I think the contract should be uh, scrapped because they are onerous. Mm -hmm. So we're not really encouraging them to. And for ex but you know, for example, uh, there are always going to be changes mm -hmm. when one reaches college. That's just the reality. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think they should scrap that contract. Just as mm -hmm. uh, the CHED has scrapped the return service contract for the, for the free tuition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, see? Um, but as we have said, you know, we need, I think, at the bottom line, good teachers. Good Whether teachers, yeah. The Philippine Science High School mm -hmm. or the Science High School in government, you know how many science high schools there are in the Philippines now? 384. Okay, science that much. Yep. It's not just yes. Philippine science high school. Okay. There, there are 128 public science high schools, 256 private, of which in 2016 and 2017, 
They had no STEM enrollees, mm -hmm. but they were okay. science high school. Mm -hmm. So something is wrong with the, with our approach. We are throwing good money. Mm -hmm. And we are not improving in our uh, exams, PISA and mm -hmm. PIS, which we have mm -hmm. already known for the last 20 years. We have minimally intervened. Mm -hmm. In spite mm -hmm. of the fact that we have 384 science high schools, hindi pa rin tayo nag-improve. Mm -hmm. So there is something that we need to review in that approach. And I think I go back. The secret is the teacher. Okay. The the and teacher. the secret is the teacher. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, related to that point, yes. Uh, I just uh, um, wanted to yes, but... react a little bit to what uh, Dr. Padolina said. Let, to, to affirm what, what he was saying, that the teacher seems to be the, the critical point here because... Yeah, you know, the quality of education, I mean, despite how much we've been spending on education, quality has not has really deteriorated the PISA results. All the, the yes. outcomes, global assessments have said that. And it's clear that uh, it, it, it's partly maybe we're not we're a, a, unable to have enough um, role models in, in schools. Teaching is not fun at all. I mean, um, just to just, learning is not fun <laughs> so but and again to uh, add to what uh, dr padilina said about you know uh because right now the the the, the thinking is always like um you know, basic education is, is is critical you know starting from all the way from the young but but even all the way to let's say if they decide to get out of uh, after finishing basic ed they decide to go to tech voc uh, this is where we should be learning, especially from Korea. I, I mean, not just watching Kor Korean novelas, no, but really looking at what the, I mean, last year, if you recall right, uh, uh, there were, there was uh, the former minister of, of, of Korea went, uh, went to PIDS and uh, discussed two things about the improvements of education quality in Korea. The first was the issue of Meister schools, uh, which are the, the, the tech box high school tech box schools in germany that they replicated in korea and when you start looking at the the, the curriculums of of these meister schools they seem to be like even more than college because the you know they're they're, they're very specialized engineering science uh, related uh, tech uh, tech voc but we don't have these kinds of things in here in in our tech voc programs second thing that uh, minister uh, juho Ju lee said was this issue of the HTHT learning, high touch, high tech learning, where you can let people learn adaptively, you know, uh, uh, by by with technology, and that has not been at all tested in the Philippines. No, we have we. I mean, we're so we're not we're, we're we. I mean, we, I think that the the point here is that we have to recognize we are in a crisis. We are in a deep crisis already because. The quality of education is 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 has been poor, and it's likely to get even poorer because of the pandemic. Uh, I don't think kids are learning whether we online or watching TV, deped deped radio or deped TV. I don't think they're learning enough, and that's going to be okay. a big problem for us in the ne in the next uh, few years. We'll have be having okay. a generation of kids who will not be appreciating. They will not be not only learning in general but especially in science yes very important points to let he um let us let us um spend a little uh a bit more time on that issue on the teachers no which has been uh, emphasized by by uh dr uh, padulina we have a question here from maureen orero and um and she asks how how do we monitor or how can we monitor and evaluate the outcomes of upscaling programs for teachers? And she's wondering if there have been improvements in teaching methods, academic performance of students, etc. cetera. Um, Dr. Padulina, would you have any insights on this? Um, should um, passing rates just be the, the, the measure or the indicator or how many students have graduated in your class? I suppose... That shouldn't be the only measure, no? Dr. Padulina? 
sir? Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you yes, hear me? sir. We can hear you. Yeah. Oppo, oppo. It, it, it's a bit complex. Starting yes. from our cultural labeling, mag-teacher ka na lang. That is the start. Mm -hmm. it, it is a very demeaning comment. And okay. So, mm -hmm. What do you get? Mag-teacher ka na lang. Hanggang sa mm -hmm. mag-board exam, mag-teacher ka na lang. Sampung beses mm -hmm. na buhuhan ng board exam. Pasa, mm -hmm. Hindi naman tinatanong ng mga eskwela kung, kung ilang beses ka pum na pumuha ng board exam bago ka pumasa. Basta mm -hmm. they let ka, okay ka na. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, th this is, th there are several measures we have to take. We have to, mm -hmm. to undertake to make sure we are we elevate the status mm -hmm. of a teacher to a degree that is more respectable. Yes. I understand yes. in Finland it is more difficult to become a teacher than to become a medical doctor. Okay. okay. And the teachers are highly paid. That is what we are we should do. Yes. However, mm -hmm. we keep increasing the salaries of teachers. What are we getting in return? Mm -hmm. What are we asking them to do in return? We keep increasing their salaries such that mm -hmm. even now the, the pub teachers have higher salaries than private sector. Mm -hmm. But what do we agree? What do, I, what do we ask them in return? Hindi tayo nag improve sa PISA. Hindi tayo nag improve sa TIMS. Hindi tayo nag improve sa primary learning material. Sabi okay. nila, what is the use of logging on if you cannot read? Okay. Thank you for uh, for those points. Very important points, Dr. Padolina. Uh, perhaps we can ask um, Dr. Laura David, since um, she is from SHED and a, a technical panel member of this uh, Committee on Science and Mathematics. Ma'am? Uh, ano po ang role ng at uh, ginagawa ng SHED dito sa aspect na, na ito? Okay. Uh, so on SHED kasi, uh, I think yung yung point ni Academician Padolina is actually um, more on our uh, high schools, no? Yung pinupoint niya na advancement of teachers. Kasi doon naman pinakita kung kailan na-excite yung ating mga sudyante mag science eh. By the time na pumunta na sila sa tertiary, uh, more or less naisip na nila yung gusto nila gawin. Yung high school yun, yung ano pa, open pa sila. So mm -hmm. I support first and foremost yung, yung pinupush ni Academia Padulina na um, dapat we treat our uh, SNT high school teachers better like, like in other uh, countries. For example, in Taiwan, ganun din, mas mahirap maging high school teacher kesa maging college teacher. You know, have very high mm -hmm. standard and also very well paid. So that goes hand in hand. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I was fortunate to be a product na almost all my teachers were PhD holders in high school. So I think with all the experience and the PhD and they do their own research, ano yun, nakatulong yun ng marami sa batch namin. So uh, one third of my entire batch went to teaching in one way or another and stayed there mm -hmm. because we wanted mm -hmm. to do what our teachers did to us. You know? So very important. Pagdating sa CHED, hindi naman sila nakakalimutan. No? E, lahat ng SNT na schools, pinupuntahan niya ng CHED at tinitignan nasa na ba yung uh, kalagayan nila in terms of uh, facility but also in terms of ano na ba yung sino ang bachelors lang. Unfortunately, may nagtuturo ng college na bachelors lang. Uh, sino yung may master's, sino yung PhD, how affiliated are their degrees with what they're teaching, uh, and we point out kung ano yung mga pwede pang development. And lalo na nung nag-transition tayo from K to 10 to K to 12, those mm -hmm. two years were actually used to give additional, parang up, up skilling nga, na the term used by Sir Buwain. We upskilled the teachers, no? nagkaroon ng ganun ng program and shed. So, for example, in my field, oceanography, yung mga graduate, yung mga mid-degree in physics, na master's or PhD, konti na lang yun na dagdag, pwede na sila magturo ng physical oceanography. But we did that, no? We, we upskilled them, we gave them more tools, and so on. 
I think that's continuing in Jed. Jed also has a scholarship program for faculty members of the HEIs. So kung meron kang uh, right now has a master's, may Jed uh, scholarship naman for them to go to their PhD. Ngayon, ano yung kulang? Um, ang kulang ay ganito, mahirap para sa isang school magpakawala ng tao. Kasi pag pinayagan kita mag-PhD, ma that position is vacant for four years. Meron ka ngang scholarship sa CHED, paano naman yung school mo? So the, the school sometimes keeps paying you, how will it pay for a substitute? So dapat may government support then that will encourage our current teachers to pursue their PhD and therefore give incentive to the institutes to provide uh, for substitution in the schools. Mm -hmm. um, also, mm -hmm. we can link the DOST Balik Scientist program to this uh, HEI. So, kunyari, may master's HEI ako, meron akong master's uh, holder na faculty. They can do their PhD elsewhere. Doon sa Balik Scientist program, hihingi ako sa DOST ng magre-replace nung taong yon for the duration of the Balik Scientist program. So, that can run from what, six months to three years. Um, and in that meantime, uh, one, they can share their knowledge. Two, they can conduct research that are locally re relevant and therefore influence the other faculty members who are there to, to pursue the same no? in a collaborative manner. And then three, sana main love dun sa lugar yung balik scientists and also want to stay. So we also have to make that um, attractive so that they will also okay. stay. So I think there is a synergy that should be um, uh, better... Uh, better made between CHED, HEIs, and DOSC. Yes. Thank you very Thank you, much, uh, Dr. David. Maraming salamat din po, ma'am. Okay. Um, let's now move to uh, other questions. We have um, uh, one from Odette Abitan. Uh, Odette uh, would like to see clarification on what demand we wish to address in increasing our pool of SMD professionals. Sabi ni, uh, tanong niya, is it domestic or global demand? At the local front, the compensation we receive on average, on average, on the average by SMD professionals is hardly an incentive to stay, but, but then we are also suffering from brain drain with our talents deciding to practice outside of the country because of better pay and opportunities. I think, sabi niya, I think that we will need to employ different strategies depending on what our priority is. And such comment was also seconded by Christian Della. And sab sabi niya, um, whether to address, uh, seeking clarification as well, whether to address the local or global demand, should we also look at the major contributors in the Philippine economy, remittances and BPOs, or engineering services, outsourcing that uh, that service, uh, okay, outsourcing services um, in, in relation to global engineering. Um, may we have your thoughts on this? Uh, Toots, can I ask you first? Yeah, maybe a quick uh, can answer. Ask to our, our other uh, people like CP um, uh, Dr. David, yeah, Dr. David, Dr. Dr. CP David. Yes, Dr. CP David. I think na mentioned nito kanina ni ano that we would like to have globally competitive, of course, S and D professionals. And um, Dr. C P, nandiyan ka ba? Hi Sheila, sorry pa. Uh, yes sir. Nag, nag uh, naging choppy yung connection ko. What was the question again? It's, uh the question sir is um Odette, uh one of our Webex participants is seeking clarification on um. Which, uh, what demand are we, uh, do we, do we wish to address when we say we would like to increase our pool of SD professionals? Is it domestic uh -huh. demand or global demand? I think Alamo both, no? <laughs> Alamo before, uh, having uh, studied in UP since nursery, no? And it mm -hmm. is drilled down to all the graduates of UP to be nationalistic and, uh, country first and so on and so forth. Alam yan nila, Doc Lau, ni Toots and everybody. Pero when when I became a little bit older, I no longer see uh, any fault of our citizens opting to work abroad. It is their individual choice to work abroad. 
whether they, they, they were forced because of uh, lower salaries uh, here or that the opportunities there are better. I, I, I don't see uh, anything wrong with our professionals migrating to other countries. Now, the, mm -hmm. the problem with that, however, is that uh, the talent pool locally will be diminished. But, mm -hmm. the, but the solution I see is to not allow them to go out. In fact, even um, recommend to some of them to proliferate abroad because later on, we will have use for them. And this is what China did. It, the solution mm -hmm. is to actually increase the supply increase the supply so that we are able to satisfy the demand both here and abroad okay okay mm -hmm. i can see uh lady satumba nodding her head uh would you would you like to share your thoughts uh with regard to this question ma'am okay thank you dr sheila yes talagang atama yan no wala naman you cannot restrict uh, mobility no, of our professionals if they want to go abroad. Pero yun nga, the greater challenge is really how uh, can we make it uh, more attractive for them to stay. Para rin yung, yung case ng mga nurses natin eh. Sabi nga, si Dr. Albert sabi niya, SNP uh, 5% lang. Ano. So how can we encourage more and more to, to serve uh, and, and enroll in SNP courses and, um, and work here, di ba? Uh, malaking factor talaga ang um, work environment, working conditions, pay, no, wage, diba? So, ang competition talaga natin ay abroad. So, if we need to look uh, into uh, what's going on in in our own uh, our workplaces, lalo na yung mga ino-offer natin incentives. Kasi kung mababa yan, lalabas talaga ng bansa. Pero maganda yung sinabi ni Dr. David na... Uh, uh, ang maganda lang doon, kung mag-abroad sila at bumalik sila, merong skills transfer eh, may knowledge transfer, so we can benefit. Mm -hmm. Yun yung tinatawag na ano, parang maganda rin sa repair migration, yung, yung reintegration uh, benefits. Okay, thank you very much uh, for your uh, thoughts, um, Idi, Idi Cha. Okay, let's entertain um, the last two questions. Um, Okay, let me just um, go through our um, chat box. Uh, there was a question before it's related to this to the study. Um, okay. Uh, okay. And this is with regard to I think this was a uh, this was uh, directed to a. Uh, Dr. Padolina on the issue of raising our PRC-led results. Um, sir, this one is from Roberto Cabardo, and he is asking for your uh, for your thoughts on... Uh, he, he said that our country's education officials are, are bent on focusing on PRC, PRC exam results when these exams are not really giving the real picture as to how good or the kind of teachers we have, or even other professionals for that matter. So um, can we have your short uh, response or remarks on this uh, <laughs> comment, sir? Because this was directed uh, to you. <laughs> OK, well, <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Can yes, sir. We can hear yeah. you very well, sir. Opo. Yeah. Uh, I think. It is a combination of factors. Mm -hmm. Curricular reform. For example, now science teachers in senior high school are expected to teach all four subjects, chemistry, mm -hmm. physics, earth science, and biology. Okay. How do you train them while they are earning their bachelor's degrees so that they can teach all four or is that not the correct is that the correct way of teaching science we we have a lot of differences a lot of debate in the science community that the spiral mm -hmm. approach is flawed 
It will not uh -huh. work for STEM. It will work only if we revert to the discipline, disciplinal approach. Now, I don't know whether they're taught that way in the pre-service training. The spiral approach is very challenging because you have to discern from simple mm -hmm. to complex. And if mm -hmm. your idea of the discipline is very shallow, then you get to a very watered down system. In addition to that, we should reform our exam, our mm -hmm. licensure exam, and limit the number of times that okay. they, that will allow individuals to to take the exam and pass, or impose a standard when you hire them to ask them uh, unless you have passed, you have taken only three times to pass it, we will not hire you. The problem is, okay. kahit na tampong beses pumasad, kinukuha pa rin natin. So, Thank you, it's, Dr. it's a combination of, uh, it, I, uh, it, it's going to take another hour for me to explain <laughs> the, the combination of, uh, of <laughs> interventions. But definitely not only the exam, but the yes. exam has to be changed. Oh, oh. Um, ang napaka-complex ng problema natin, sir. Ano? Uh, kulang ang um, ang webinar na ito at kulang ang ating open forum para ma-discuss lahat ng ng problema at mga recommendations. Okay, this will be our last question. How can you Okay, nawala siya bigla. Okay, how can you help upgrade or polish the qualification standards? For the STEM discipline graduates set forth by the Civil Service Commission, particularly those seeking employment in the public sector. This is a question from Shalito Santos. Kanina pinakita, may pinakitang slide si Dr. Laura David, I think, no? We're in a, may, may uh, meron siyang uh, kinoment about yung mga mini, minimum qualifications or qualification standards for STEM graduates set forth by uh, the PSC. Uh, can someone answer this? Ano yung masasabi niyo? Paano kaya natin ma-upgrade uh, or mapapalish yung qualification standards? Anyone from our panel of uh, speakers? Toots, I can see you on my screen. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, my, my, my initial thoughts are really just all those standards were adopted to make sure that we have good people. Kaya lang nagiging problema is we stick with them and then they take a life of its own. We're, and then mm -hmm. we're, we're not able to be flexible enough to recognize the, something very simple. Pag ikaw ay nat natapos ng basic education, hindi ka pa rin pwedeng ma-hire ma sa gobyerno. Kailangan college graduate ka. Eh kung tutusin mo, basic ed, the key to 12 was actually uh, changed so that they, they they could in theory get employed and yet employed. there are employed. there are there are issues about getting them into into government so that's a that's a that's an issue i mean the, uh, so i think uh, the the entire education uh, from dep ed uh, group mm -hmm. to ed tesda will need to sit down with with the civil service commission because those kinds of things about uh, standards need to keep changing it's not really just even know it's it's really should be skills eh. it's not it's not the it's not what you attain but the kinds of skills that you have that matter more mm -hmm. thank you uh, very much to see yes uh okay can we have uh ed uh satumba first then i will call uh, mr buhain Okay. okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, uh, siguro uh, two ways. Una, we need to look at uh, the market, no? Uh, kasi yung, sa totoo lang, napaka-revealing nung, ano, eh, nung study ni Dr. Albert, na napaka-baba ng salary grade levels ng mga SNT professionals okay. natin sa government. And it's so hard to encourage them to enter government. Uh, napaka-baba ng pay. Sa kami, for example, no, we've been looking for uh, for computer programmers Pero napakababa ng SG. Wala kami makuha. More than one year na. Oh, okay. Pero sa private sector, there are a lot of uh, of, of uh, experts no yung sa field na yun. Pero yun nga, kasi so, di, kailangan talaga i-review yung, yung uh, qualification standards as against the competencies. 
na required okay. ng, yes. ng job na yon. So, para oh. ma-encourage sila to really enter government. Otherwise, we will not get a um, good good SNT uh, professional mm-hmm. sa government. Well said, uh, E.B. Cha. And I think yung Magna Carta for SNT professionals, uh, nag apply lang yun sa DOST. Tama ba? So even though there are SNT professionals in other departments or other government agencies, hindi nag apply yung Magna Carta. Can I say Tama something? Ba? Can I say something? Yes, sir. Ay, sir. Yes, Secretary Dina Peña, sir. Hindi, hindi. Uh, nung dati, pinapadaan lang dito sa amin yung pag-designate uh, kung sino yung mag enjoy sa kanilang agencies. But uh, after, the, after the law was revised, ay decentralized na. So basta they follow. Okay. So the different uh, departments uh, determine who among them can enjoy the Magna Carta. Ah, ganun pala yun, but, sir. Uh, so even but, from but, other... But, but they should follow our, ano, our standard. I see. Okay. Ang masasabi okay. ko naman, alam mo yung sinasabi niyong mababa ang sweldo sa gobyerno, ay parang hindi na ganun katama ngayon. Kasi uh, nakikita ko na meron, eh, doon na lang sa mga sa anak ko, ano, na uh, ika nga, eh, eh, doktor pa, ano, and uh, UP pa. Pero kung ikukumpet mo yung sweldo niya sa private against our sweldo, parang ano na eh. Parang mas mataas na tayo. Siguro doon sa mga IT na sinasabi, baka totoo yun. Anyway, but uh, uh, the other thing that I would like to say about the uh, qualifications, ano, kahit ano pa yung uh, qualification doon ng CSC, alam mo, dinadaan namin sa exam. Ano? Hanggang mm-hmm. ngayon, sinisisi pa ako dito sa TOSD, but daw ako yung pinagawa ng exam para doon sa mga papasok na mag apply Hindi daw sila pumasapasa doon sa kanilang mga uh, sa exam na ibinigay. Habi ko, hindi, palitan ninyo yung exam na binigay ko 10 years ago pag ginawa yung exam na yan, eh hindi daw sila makapasa doon sa aking exam na ibinibigay. Anyway, mm-hmm. ang punto ko doon, pwedeng masala sa screening process okay. ng, ng opisina. Okay. Okay. Maraming salamat, Secretary De La Peña. And uh, Mr. Buhain, uh, I think you would like to say something related to uh, uh, the question, sir. Yeah, I think I just wanted to reiterate the uh, emphasis placed by Dr. Um, Calvert on what's really important is skills, not so much uh, the degrees. And, um, you know, uh, in this in this framework of lifelong learning, where uh, you, you want people with a growth mindset who can learn, unlearn, and relearn. So th- that's that's a that's a functional competency in life that will do well for any employee, whether in the public sector or in the private sector. Uh, you know, we in the private sector encourage human resource officers to be very transformational in how they can reimagine, uh, you know, how learning, training, and development is being delivered uh, to their employees, and also finding its way in how they recruit from the fresh young uh, graduates. So I think I think we're also trying to see how it, to to take the example earlier that if you're a grade 12 um, graduate, how can you be employable? What what bridge programs can be done? Uh, whether whether pre-employment or during employment, you know, somebody was talking about the German dual education system earlier and how Korea was using it. I think those are very impressive programs and we can certainly adapt and modify them to be more suitable to the Philippine environment. But certainly we have to go beyond this concept that you need a college degree in order to get a good job or career. You've really got to be able to offer alternate pathways. Um, you know, I think that's my uh, comment there. Thank you very much, Mr. Buhain. Um, friends, uh, there are lots of... Uh, important takeaways that we can glean from today's discussion. We have heard of the needed policy reforms and interventions in our educate, education and training sector and in our labor sector as well. Um, we have also discussed the important role being played by both the government and the private sector. And all of this point to the fact that no one sector can do it alone. Uh, there should be synergy and collaboration among these various uh, development actors and sectors to address our SNT human resource gaps and build a workforce that is equipped 
uh, to face the demands of Industry 4.0 and also take advantage of the opportunities arising from it. At this point, uh, please join me in thanking our speakers, our presenters, our discussants for uh, the insights that uh, they have shared with us this afternoon. Let us give them a big virtual clap and marami ding salamat sa lahat ng mga nag uh, join sa ating open forum. Friends, uh, to formally end our, web our webinar is the director of DOST Science Education Institute, um, Dr. Uh, Josette uh, Bio. Um, she is an educator with more than 25 years of teaching experience. She also served as director of the Philippine Science High School, Western Visayas Campus, and eventually became the executive director of the Philippine Science High School System. Friends, Dr. Joseph Dio. Ma'am? Magandang hapon sa inyong lahat. And we indeed have a very intense and insightful discussion this afternoon. So on behalf of the Science Education Institute, our warmest thanks and congratulations to the Philippine Institute for Development Studies for coming up with this valuable and timely research and especially for this webinar. We are especially grateful to the team, to PIDS President, Dr. Celia Reyes, to the authors, Dr. Ramon Albert, uh, Dr. Ana Maria Tabunda, Dr. Carlos Primo David, Dr. Chris Francisco, Dr. Janet Cuenca, Mr. Charlie Levina, and Ms. Jana Flor Yesmanos. Thank you too to our panel of reactors. It is our privilege to partner with PIDS in these efforts to track the status of our SNT workforce and determine the future of SNT human resource requirements in the Philippines. There is a dearth of research in this area, despite the importance and apparent impact of SNT human resources in various fields and industries. I hope this study will be useful in setting directions and improving policies not only at the DOST SEI, but in other agencies and organizations as well. Perhaps we can explore other noteworthy details in separate studies in the future. For instance, a more comprehensive research about our female SNT human resource and the reasons why they have to leave the labor force, or a study and methods to match students with degree programs. This would help us create programs and strategies to retain and re-inspire talents which we have encouraged to choose S and T. Also, since the study was done before COVID-19, it will be interesting to see that the, the one that would reflect the changes in S and T careers as a result of the pandemic. The findings and recommendations are indeed crucial in crafting scholarship policies and in developing teacher training and youth science promotion programs, which are the core services of DOST SEI. While some of the findings are disheartening, it also gives us perspective, especially now, that we are re restructuring many of our programs to fit in the new normal. Considering the study's demand and supply projections, SEI will be more aggressive in promoting life sciences physical sciences, mathematics and statistics, and engineering courses where an undersupply of S&T workers by 2025 is predicted. We will continue improving our responsiveness, beefing up scholarship benefits and digitizing data and processes, training more science and mathematics teachers, and encouraging them to pursue graduate studies and reaching out to elementary and high school students, not only to spark their interest in science and technology, but also to help them in choosing courses that best fit their passion and skills. There is much work to be done, but I have no doubt that our efforts will bear fruits. SEI, in fact, have made great strides in re recent years. The number of scholarship slots for both undergraduate and graduate programs significantly increased. In 2014, when I entered SEI, there were only 3,000 allocated slots for incoming freshmen. In 20, last year, this already increased to almost 10,000 slots for incoming freshmen. And for this year, we will welcome 14,000 new scholars in the undergraduate level only. 
I'm happy to announce that as of 2021, we are currently supporting a total of 43,400 scholars nationwide, 36,500 at the undergraduate level, 4,500 pursuing their MS, and 2,400 pursuing their, their PhDs. And we have about 200 scholars studying in other parts of the world pursuing priority areas which are not yet strong in the Philippines. We have also democratized the scholarship programs to ensure that there will be scholars in all the 1,655 municipalities nationwide. When I entered SEI in 2014, only 76% of the municipalities are covered by the scholarship program. This year, we have scholars in 98% of the municipalities, and this is because of the aggressive promotion of the SNT programs uh, being conducted by the Institute. SEI also works closely with the consortium universities to expand the reach of graduate scholars and to capacitate university faculty through graduate scholarships. So I also would like to make mention that we work closely with DepEd and the 16 consortium university members who are considered as centers of excellence in education in, provide, in providing teacher trainings and also developing uh, curriculum materials for teaching science and math at the basic education level. Currently, we are conducting studies in the regions on the impact of these teacher trainings to the teaching and learning process. And also, um, the local counterpart of the Balik Scientist program, we also have our graduate fellowship or placement program, which we call career incentive program. So it's a reality na kahit nakatapos ng MS at PhD yung ating mga scholars, sometimes walang field or walang placement. So uh, what SEI has been doing for the past uh, four years is that we hire these graduate students yung nakatapos ng MS at PhD, SEI pays them. Uh, medyo maganda din yung starting salary nila, like for an MS graduate, with or without experience, uh, SG19, that's 56,000 a month. And for a PhD graduate, that's uh, 80 plus a month. And we fill them to research institutes or even universities na nangangailangan na mga researchers to, to beef up their uh, research capability. So, sa ngayong buwan, mga 200 na ang nahire namin. And even if this was intended only for our MS and PhD, so graduate in the Philippines, uh, marami na rin tayong mga scholars na gumraduate abroad na nag-signify that they want to uh, be part of this career incentive program. And uh, during this pandemic also, we have developed resources uh, to support DepEd using radio and television as um, medium, no? like for example, a radio escuela in the Tuklas Shensa. And all, all these modules have been done by the Science Education Institute using our scholars as talents or resource persons. So these are just some of the results of hard work and collaboration between DOST, SEI, um, and other individuals and institutions such as PIDS. We hope to continue this partnership with their inputs. We can better serve our stakeholders. Again, maraming salamat, PIDS, and to all of you for spending a remarkable afternoon with us. And uh, maraming salamat din po, uh, Dr. Joseph, Joseph uh, Bio of, um, of uh, SEI and for, for, um, for your closing remarks and for, for collaborating with the ideas on this, uh, um, not just on the conduct of the research, but also on this uh, knowledge dissemination activity. Okay, so before we close, uh, we finally close, I would like to announce that Two winners will receive a PIDS notebook. They are Joyce Mauyon and Reggie Salonga. I repeat, Joyce Mauyon and Reggie Salonga, our team will get in touch with you for, uh, the, for the delivery of your prize. And finally, we have some reminders. Okay. Um, okay. Friends, you may access all the presentations from today's webinar from our website and flash on the screen. Also are the links to the full study. And a while ago, I was checking our chat box and I think Dr. C.P. David, David and Dr. Ramon 
Albert also shared um, other references related to our discussion today. Okay, and also uh, please um, do take time to answer the feedback survey that will pop on your screen after this webinar. We will email, email you the link after the event. Uh, friends, your comments are very important to us to uh, improve the quality of our webinars. Please also regularly visit our website and social media pages. Okay, and maraming salamat sa lahat ng tumutok sa atin sa Facebook at sa ating social, sa ating uh, Twitter. And also, um, another month is coming to an end. So maraming salamat po sa lahat ng uh, nanood sa atin at participate sa ating webinars uh, this February. Sa March, I, uh, we have two webinars again. On March 11, we will have uh, a webinar on uh, digital platforms implications for the Philippines and developing Asia. We are um, organizing this with the uh, Asian Development Bank. And on March 25, uh, we'll have another um, a webinar on, uh, the, on the digital economy. This time, we will tease uh, some of the specific uh, challenges uh, related to online work, such as digital divide, job security, social protection, and other issues. Okay, and uh, finally, friends, uh, we would like to thank all the representatives from uh, the various uh, sectors, from government, from civil society, from the private sector, from uh, the academe, from the media for um, attending our webinar this afternoon, or, and for staying on until the end of our webinar. Okay, so we hope you have learned something <laughs> valuable. <laughs> sir? Can I just express my own thanks to PIDS, the, the President Celia, to uh, the Resources Committee, to our thanks to PIDS, the President Celia, to our resource persons, to our study team. And uh, I'm happy to note that there are uh, some experts who have been, uh, shall we say, focusing on science and technology within PIDS. I could uh, recall uh, many, <laughs> several years ago, uh, Dr. Albert and uh, I have already started working on this uh, uh, innovation indicators uh, way, way back, you know? and uh, so I'm, I'm just uh, happy that there are people like him who have been focusing on science and technology. Thank you very much. Yes. Looking forward, sir, for more uh, collaborations in research yes. and knowledge exchange um, on SNT, on SNT S. Science, Technology, and Innovation Research po. Maraming salamat po, Secretary uh, Fortunato, Secretary Boy de la Peña. Honored to have you, sir, in our um, activity this afternoon. Friends, we hope you have learned something valuable from our webinar this afternoon. Please stay safe and stay healthy and stay informed too. See you in March for the continuation of our uh, webinar series. Maraming salamat po and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.